Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, I'm going to be talking with astrologer Aaron Fogel about talking about intergenerational healing through astrology. So, hey, Aaron, welcome to the show. Hey, Chris, thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, I'm really happy to have you on the show um, this time. So we actually met, what was it, like three or four years ago when I came and gave a workshop on Hellenistic astrology in Toronto for the local astrology group there, right? Yeah, I was trying to remember when that was, maybe 2018. I think your book had just come out. Um, and I was like, what's Hellenistic astrology? <laughs> so that was kind of like an introduction to it for me, which was really exciting. And then I ended up diving into it more after that. Awesome. Yeah, that was a really fun time, a really good group. And is that group Astrology Toronto that's still around? Yeah, um, it's been around in various like formal and informal stages since the 80s, actually. Um, and uh, so I'm now one of their official board members, but it's a it's a pretty cool group. Like they mostly try to support emerging or newer astrology speakers in the Toronto area. And then we do kind of like a bigger speaker weekend intensive every year. So you are our like bigger speaker for that um, that year. And we have Jason Holly coming in June. So I'm excited for that. Nice. Awesome. All right. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, uh, where should we start with this topic of um, intergenerational healing through astrology? And what's your access point or, or what was your starting point with this topic for wanting to dive into it? Yeah. Uh, uh, one thing that's probably like helpful to mention before anything else is uh, when talking about intergenerational themes, there will be be definitely some touching on like themes of trauma and we might go into some difficult topics. So I just wanted to mention that at the start in case uh, anyone finds that they might want to come back to this later or, you know, hit pause and um, do what they need for themselves if we're talking about some difficult stuff. Uh, but yeah, so for myself personally, this is kind of like a research project that's been developing over the last few years or so. And um, I have a lot of different things that I try to merge in my life under like the healing arts umbrella. And so uh, in addition to my work with astrology and tarot and stuff like that, I've done a lot of like trauma healing and trauma focused work. And so I think a lot about how those fields can come together, how astrology can be a tool for trauma healing. And so it almost accidentally happened that I started thinking about it more through an intergenerational lens. Um, I have been doing a lot of work in my own personal life over the last few years around this theme. And uh, I come from a family of Holocaust survivors, and so it's been part of my personal journey to sort of look into what uh, themes in my personal life might be connected to some of those themes in my ancestry. Um, and then because astrology is a huge part of my life, I always try to use astrology um, in conjunction with that. And then the more I did that, the more they started to merge. And I started to see um, these really interesting parallels uh, between uh, like some of the recent research in intergenerational trauma and healing. And then a lot of the things that we know about astrology and cycles and uh, different patterns that we notice through astrology. Right. Okay. So part of it is, I guess, part of the starting point is realizing that people have sort of sometimes individual traumas in their life that shape their lives, but then sometimes there can be um, broader uh, generational traumas that influence people that, that occurred before a person was even born, but still have some impact or influence on the present. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, and so, yeah, there's different ways that we can look at trauma that's passed on. And one of those ways is through our family systems and looking at experiences that happen to our parents, grandparents, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, like you said, there's sort of like collective traumas that can happen to people based on, um, you know, location in the world, uh, race, culture, uh, gender identity, sexual identity. And, and those are um, larger sort of connective traumas that people can go through just based on their identity. Um, and so a lot of the research around intergenerational trauma has started to understand that um, 
individuals go through different traumatic experiences in their lives. Uh, but then often when you start to look at the generations that come after, like as those people have children, it might be that someone goes through something really challenging in their own life and then they give birth to a child that actually is showing the impact of that trauma, even though they haven't themselves gone through it. And so it's kind of like a way of looking at the, um, the connective pieces between different experiences and, and how they kind of uh, get passed on through the generations. Right. That seems really important. Um, I guess part of it is even recognizing and part of your work um, in counseling has been recognizing individual traumas within a person's life, how powerful those can be um, in shaping a person's life and identity and actions from that point forward. Um, and, and that's something that you've tried to look at through the lens of astrology just in a single life on its own. Yeah, exactly. And I find um, I've been working with clients for uh, about 11 years now. And I find that um, a lot of the time people come to me with like a, a really beautiful level of self-awareness, like they know themselves fairly well, they know their personal histories fairly well. Um, but there's this question of like, what to do with it all. And so I, I feel like the biggest pe uh, question that people ask me in consultation is like, well, what do I do? Or like, okay, I know this, or I know where this trigger comes from, or I know that this is like a part of my history, um, but what do I do with that? And so that's something that I find astrology has been really beautiful for is like uh, uh, helping us make sense of our experience but also placing it in a larger context. And, um, you know, I think about astrology as like a, a context of like us in our larger environment, like we're part of this, like much larger system that's happening in the solar system. Um, but then also this new sort of lens or this work that I'm trying to bring in with the intergenerational theory is a whole other context for it as well. It's like we, we are small little pieces within these like very big systems that we are a part of essentially. Right. That makes sense. Um, let's expand on that initial thing of just like individual traumas. Cause I realized now in leading into this discussion that that's something I've never really covered on the podcast, the idea that you can even look at or potentially see um, some individual traumas that a person might be struggling with through their birth chart or their transits or what have you. What are some of the types of things that come up that you see when, you, when you're dealing with clients that have trauma or what are some different types of trauma that sometimes you see um, or, or ways that those show up in the birth chart? I guess we, you don't may not necessarily want to give like signatures per se, but I'm just curious to contextualize the discussion, like what kind of things we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there are so many uh, ways that we can look at that. But one, one thing that I like to keep in mind as much as possible when I'm working with people is that I'm looking at their chart and usually talking to them as an adult, but their chart is just their birth moment. And so it's like whatever we're talking about in their chart was there in the moment of their birth. And a lot of people do not have easy birth stories. And so, yeah, it's it's probably not like super helpful to try to give like uh, signatures or anything like that. But um, even just looking at uh, someone's chart and trying to imagine, okay, what would this be as a birth story? Like, what is Mars doing? What is Jupiter doing? And, and try to get some context can give you a lot of information about what kind of tone is being set for that, that person's life. Um, and, uh, and then from there, I try to look at, um, the sun and the moon as like signatures of someone's early caregiver experience. So a lot of the time that might be the mother and the father and how absent or present they were, um, or just other caregivers that were really, uh, primary in that person's life. Um, but it's also interesting to look at, uh, progressions and and transits and, and start to see sort of like windows of time because I don't think that any signature that someone is born with is like immediately prescriptive like to say that someone has this aspect means that they're automatically going to go through some kind of like 
horrible experience with it. It's more like, okay, they have this kind of like fabric that they're working with and what kind of um, doorways or like sensitive triggers have happened around those aspects in their lives. And uh, so a lot of the time you can start to get a sense of like what might have happened when based on like the progressions and transits over the course of their life. Okay. That makes sense. Um, that brings up like a similar debate that I've seen recently um, in recent years in some of the younger generations of astrologers and debates over whether like uh, an astrologer can say that a specific signature indicates like a mental illness or something like that. And I think it's often as a, as a pushback against pop astrology when somebody says something dumb like all Sagittariuses or something have whatever mental illness or something like that. Um, which is just obviously not true. Um, but then it, it, on the other side of it raises a question of like, can astrology be used in a way that's um, helpful or, or, or moral or what have you in order to help people who are struggling with specific issues of mental illness? And what is the approach to take that is appropriate for things like that? It seems like it almost gets into a sort of territory like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'm definitely in the camp of astrologers that I, I don't feel that like any particular chart signature or aspect necessitates a specific kind of experience, even someone having like, you know, a besieged Venus or something. It, it's like, you don't know exactly what that's going to mean for that person until you sit down and have a conversation with them. Um, but working on someone's chart before meeting with them for the first time, I can get a sense of like what sensitive spots might be or like where they've had challenges. It's just that I don't know necessarily exactly what the details of those challenges are going to be yet. So again, I, I try to think about it more as like context, like uh, as astrologers, we have a lot of context by looking at someone's chart but that person is an individual who's been living their whole life. And, and so I try to hold a middle ground in a consultation between like opening the space for someone to share more about their specific experiences if they feel comfortable or if they feel like that's useful, but also not um, being prescriptive to them about what I think they've been through unless that's a conversation they want to have. And I think that's important. And and it sometimes doesn't matter. Like, I think if there's a really, really challenging thing that you see in someone's chart, sometimes the details don't actually matter. And so I've had a lot of consultations with clients over the years where it's like, I don't actually know like what they've been through, but I know they've been through something because I can see that there's some really intense stuff going on in their chart. And it doesn't necessarily matter for them to share the details of that story for us to be able to talk about like how they can find healing or, you know, wh where they can sort of like work with those challenges in their life. Sure. Yeah. So you can identify through um, tense combinations in the chart, some areas where there might be a greater tendency to have some challenges that arise. Um, but sometimes just being able to speak in broad archetypal terms um, kind of frees you from having to focus too much on the details of that and instead focus on some of the possibilities for how a person might grow uh, or, or learn from some of those things. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I kind of find that it works the other way around from people saying like, oh, if you have this aspect or this placement, it means that you're going to have this experience. I prefer to work the other way around where it's like someone is coming to me and, and sharing their story or like sharing their experience. And then we can provide an astrology context for like what that is. Um, and, and that can be, uh, I find like a really useful way of making meaning of the experience, but also, yeah, like placing it in a larger context where then that person has um, some level of empowerment or agency over their experience and, and over uh, what they choose to do with that experience. Right. That seems so important. And that's something new students don't often hear, but it's a good like first rule of doing consulting astrology is to make sure whatever you're doing is like helpful to the client and is healing to the client as opposed to is something you say actually going to be detrimental to them or is that information that may actually harm them in some way, in which case 
that may not that's not the best route to take that the primary like directive in astrology like with medicine should be to do no harm absolutely i think about this all the time because um i started learning astrology and started my practice a little before the resurgence of like traditional astrology and and hellenistic work so i didn't know about sect or like maltreatment or bonification or anything like that. When I started my practice, I mostly uh, learned initially through like a modern psychological lens. Um, And I did a lot of my learning just from like consulting with people and like starting with pay what you can readings. That was just like friends of friends and stuff like that. Um, And so I learned about working with people, I think, before I learned about some of the the deeper and more specific techniques that I now bring into my practice. And so now I know that there's no point in telling someone that they have like um, a maltreated Venus because it's not going to it's not going to help my client in any way, unless maybe that client is like a studying astrologer and wants to like know those details. Mm -hmm. 99% of my clients are not astrologers and like, it's just confusing to them if I like use too much astrology jargon. So they only want to know like what is going to be helpful for them. Or if I see something challenging, like what does that mean for them as a person living their lives and doing their best? Like how, how can I, work with them in that? How can I like support them in that? Yeah. I think about that a lot because um, like you and I, this whole first generation of astrologers that started with modern astrology and then learned traditional astrology, um, I think it's allowed us to take some of the really great counseling insights and a lot of the great cautions that the astrologers of like the 1980s and 90s who got into psychological, like depth, depth psychology, astrology were so focused on in terms of making sure that you weren't doing harm to clients, um, incorporating concepts from psychology and counseling like transference and countertransference and other things like that. Um, so much of this first generation of astrologers that had made that transition from modern tradi- to traditional have taken some of the best pieces from the psychological stuff, but then they're just integrating that with some of the more sophisticated, like technical models of traditional astrology. But I do sometimes one, I do sometimes worry about like the second generation of astrologers after the traditional revival and whether they won't, if they start with traditional completely, if they won't be missing some of those counseling dynamics that were so important in like late 20th century, early 21st century astrology. It's something I think about a, a lot. So, yeah. Yeah. I also think about that like constantly <laughs> and uh, even just like um, Demetra George was like one of my favorite astrologers, like before Project Hindsight too. And, and like reading, oh my gosh, I'm going to forget the exact name of it, but, um, uh, her book mysteries of the dark moon goddess. Do you know which Mm -hmm. one I'm talking about? Yeah. Mysteries of the dark moon, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That was like one of my favorite books when I was like learning astrology and, uh, it's very still like grounded in like, uh, the traditional myths and, and there's a lot of like really, uh, structured technique in it as well, but it's also like Demetra in in her more psychological phase of astrology. And I think that really resonated with me because it is about working with people. And like, obviously not every astrologer is like a consulting astrologer, but for me, that's like 75% of my practice. And so it does come back to this question of like, am I helping people or am I not helping people? And like, if I'm not helping them, what is the point of consultation? And so even just for me, like my interest in astrology was sparked because uh, in my early twenties, I was like looking for something to make meaning of what I was going through at that time and having my own challenging experiences and kind of feeling like, um, you know, uh, more like, uh, left brain theory was sort of like failing to explain what I was going through. And then, uh, I went for an astrology reading and was like, 
oh. <laughs> so it just provided like a, like a context for what I was going through and ended up being this really helpful tool. But um, I think at that time, if I think back to what was going on in my life, if I had started studying astrology then, uh, looking at it specifically through a Hellenistic lens, I think it would have made things harder for me in a way because I happen to have a chart that's like, really not great if you're going to look at it in, in a more binary way. And so I would have just been like, oh, everything's terrible. Like, what's the point? <laughs> and so like coming to astrology through a more uh, like healing focused lens and then later having the context to be like, oh, OK, there's like a ton of really difficult things happening in my chart, like through these specific techniques. Um, I was able to be like, okay, well, I've been subversive with that, or I've like, uh, used that, uh, with, with collective vision or, you know, like tried to understand just like what the deeper purpose of those challenges were. Yeah, that makes sense. And <clears throat> yeah, it'll just be interesting as a generational shift to see how that goes. I mean, I think there's good resources, there's becoming more resources out there now than there were 10 years ago um, that kind of blend modern and traditional astrology. And I'm kind of excited about that. That's why I'm happy that there's books like, you know, Channing Nicholas's book, which is really good for beginners that blends both uh, Hellenistic, like ancient astrology and modern astrology. And it, it approaches it with, um, both of those worlds in mind in a way that I think that would be helpful for a newer person that if they were in like a situation like you were in in the early 20s? Absolutely. And I, maybe it feels like very relevant also to our conversation today about like intergenerational stuff because it's so beautiful that we have all this really grounded technique now from the Hellenistic era to um, inform the astrology work that we're doing. And also, like, hopefully humanity is not exactly in the same place that we were at that time, uh, or maybe in some ways we are. <laughs> but it's just like, we do also like live in a different era and in a different time period. And so the kind of changes that happened for astrology and for humans between then and now, I think should also be part of the way we practice. And uh, I, I think there's like um, a lot more space for like nuance and gray area within that kind of blended practice that really speaks to me that is maybe not quite as like uh, binary, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think, I think we're getting there um, now that the you know, it's been almost a full Saturn cycle since the revival of traditional astrology. I think we're at the point where the revival is sort of finished in terms of digging it up. And now people are, you know, putting it to work and adapting it to modern times and integrating it with some of the counseling and psychological techniques of contemporary astrology. So that's that's the phase that we're in now is the full integration. Um, but yeah, that brings up um, brings us back to our topic in terms of intergenerational theory. Um, I know one thing you were going to talk about was epigenetics, which I was curious curious about. Yeah, so uh, I think epigenetics is like a good kind of like groundwork to discuss if we're talking about intergenerational theory because it's uh, a little bit like the nuts and bolts of how it works. So, like full disclaimer, I'm not a scientist, uh, but I have done my best to like piece together some like fairly grounded understanding of it in order to like help me understand like what what we're actually doing here for, for talking about like intergenerational trauma and healing like what does that mean like what's actually happening in our bodies or in our brains um, when we're going through those experiences so epigenetics is essentially like a study of how our environment and our experience um, can cause changes that affect how our DNA works. So uh, epigenetics is not changes happening to your DNA, like that that's like a genetic shift. Epigenetics is like our response to our DNA. And so it's basically like brain programming that responds to our DNA in different ways. So um, they're, they're like these little chemical tags that get added or subtracted to our DNA in response to things that are happening in our environment and our experience. And that's basically what um, epigenetics is. So it, it's sort of 
uh, the scientific proof that um, our experience impacts the way that we are, essentially. But it, it's a little bit different from just like a, a nurture versus nature debate, because a lot of the field of epigenetics has been looking at like um, the impact of family and intergenerational transfer. Um, and so they, they've they seen even like um, if there's a parent who goes through a traumatic experience and they already have a kid before they've gone through that experience, that kid who's already been born is not going to show any sign of that trauma impacting them directly. But if the parent has another child after they've gone through that traumatic experience, that newer child is going to show like actual different responses to their DNA patterning based on the fact that they've been born to that parent after this traumatic event. So that's kind of like the, the way that epigenetics looks at things. Um, and there are tons of like really interesting universal experiences uh, that they've been studying around things like illness and pregnancy um, and uh, the fascinating ways in which people's bodies begin to interpret DNA differently after uh, being pregnant and giving birth or going through some kind of chronic illness, like people's bodies actually start to um, to uh, respond differently. And uh, so that those are kind of like very relatable experiences that have been widely studied, but then also these different environmental circumstances like trauma or or the opposite or really um, supportive environments that people have can impact the response to DNA as well. Okay. So it's like nature versus nurture is still a thing in and of itself in terms of a person's like individual life or or the role that a person's sort of inborn traits have versus their upbringing or the circumstances they find themselves in. But then there's this other element that can carry over um, not just one generation, but also multiple generations potentially. Yeah, exactly. It's like you're born with the DNA that you're going to be born with. Um, and I think there's probably like some gray area that started to happen in like uh, more pop psychology stuff now where it's like you can like change your DNA through like positive thinking. <laughs> and uh, this is not quite that, um, but it is like starting from this understanding that uh what we go through influences uh, what happens with our DNA. And so it's like, yeah, you can't change like the people that you're born to and the genetic imprint that you have as a result of that. Um, but the experiences that you go through will thoroughly impact the way that that does or does not get directly expressed in your experience. And so that can work both ways, like both in an adverse way where like, going through trauma can like create new imprints and like how we're responding to our DNA, but also can change the ones that we have for the better. Like we have the uh, capacity to start to um, change some of those like um, on off switches that get built over time. Okay. Um, so, and this comes up especially, I guess, is especially important when you're talking about trauma and intergenerational trauma and the potential for some of that to be passed down um, between generations. Yeah, exactly. So, intergenerational work is essentially looking at like um, the way that survivors of different traumatic experiences will pass on the imprints of that to their physical offspring. Um, and then they're like, now that they've been looking at this for like enough time, like we're now onto third generations and fourth generations where it's like, oh, it's actually not just the children of survivors, it's their grandchildren and then their great grandchildren as well. And the field has been around long enough to see that there is this kind of like imprint that gets passed on. And so the epigenetics is just like the more like science-based component of it that's looking at what's happening at the DNA level. Um, but it is essentially to say that 
people who go through trauma um, and don't have really like an opportunity to like integrate that or like come back to some kind of homeostasis will then pass that on to their children and so forth and so forth. And, uh, and also that epigenetics shows us that we have the capacity to start to like interrupt some of those like familiar neural pathways as well through our environment or, or through the experiences we're having. Okay. Got it. Um, yeah. And I can see why that would be important just because even in an individual life or generation, I think everyone experiences to a greater or lesser extent um, what it's like to, like to grow up in an environment where if one of your parents has had or, or caregivers has had some sort of significant trauma or some part of their life that's really tricky or delicate in the way that that influences their ability to like give and receive love or their ability to communicate or do different things that affect you sort of growing up in that environment. Mm -hmm, exactly. And I think there's also like other perspectives in psychology that look at this too, like attachment theory and stuff like that, which is sort of like looking at different ways that your parents may or may not have been and like how that impacts your, your way of connecting with people now. Um, but, but that's essentially it. It's like, if, if your parent or caregiver has gone through something difficult and they're raising you and, you know, not fully able to be entirely like present and receptive, then that's going to impact you. But it's looking at it in a kind of larger context as well. It, like the, the saying hurt people, hurt people comes to mind where it's just mm. like this kind of hot potato that can get passed on from generation to generation. And it's like, okay, well, why was that parent not able to be present? And like, what was happening before that and before that, and kind of looking at this uh, piece that's getting passed on. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and so part of your work is that you've also um, looked at it not just from that perspective, from the more scientific perspective, but also from your perspective as an astrologer as well. Yeah, exactly. And uh, one of the things that I really enjoy doing with clients um, is to do like family system charts and to be able to like look at the charts of their siblings and parents and potentially grandparents as well as part of consultations that we do uh, because then we are placing them like in context of this larger kind of cycle or pattern that they are a part of and so again like thinking about someone's chart as their birth moment or their birth experience um, provides this whole other layer of context where it's like, okay, well, they're born into something that's already in motion. Like this is the start of this person's life, um, but they're just being born into this like story that's already been happening. And it's really incredible to see like the connections between what's happening in that person's chart and what's happening in their parents' charts and grandparents' charts. And you can see the whole story playing out that way, essentially. Uh, totally. And that's that's always been one of the f most fascinating things about astrology to me from day one was like starting to look at your parents and other family members' charts and suddenly having a, a different access point for understanding them and who they are and like why they are the way that they are in different ways for better or worse and having a different take on that that's like outside of yourself and is, is almost independent or um, you know less invested in, a, in in the way that you are in the sense of having your own particular viewpoint on things and experiences but also just realizing that your birth chart itself is a transit to your parents' birth charts that's just kind of permanently there in some ways. And understanding what they were going through at, at the time of your birth can be kind of interesting and insightful. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, like exactly that thinking about your chart as like a transit to your parents charts is kind of wild and i can't tell you like how i'm i'm sure you've noticed this like so many people are just like born during their parents saturn return and that's just like a very common like right. <laughs> relatable experience that many and then okay then you have like the same saturn placement so anytime you have a transit um that's impacting your saturn like your parent is also having that exact same transit and so that already starts to like open up so 
so much like interesting thought around um, like the connection between our experiences and our family experiences. Yeah. Um, so I, I already that comes to mind. You mentioned the Saturn return, and I was just thinking that before you said because I think about like my parents and my father was going through his Saturn return when I was born, but a year before that, they had had another child, my brother, but he passed away of like sudden infant death syndrome. So just as an infant, and then I came along like as they were grieving that process and realizing that uh, my dad had Saturn in the fifth house in a night chart. And so part of his Saturn return was like losing one child and then a year later, like having another child essentially. And that's like part of the context then in which I show up and part of that transit in his life at that time. Yeah, that's that's a, probably such a beautiful but also heartbreaking example of like exactly how this works. And then I would imagine whatever is happening in your chart has some theme of that or some thread of that, that like in, in some way that process that happened even before you were born is part of like the imprint that's there from your dad or from your parents or the experience that was happening, like leading up to your birth as well. Yeah. Um, and it also speaks to, cause there could have been somebody else with like Saturn in the fifth house and a night chart where they, they might not have had that exact same experience, obviously of losing a child during their Saturn return and having another child or what have you, but there could have been some other similar, um, you know, I, I had a friend who had Saturn a few years ago that had Saturn in the fifth house in a night chart and he had an, un, they had two children already and then all of a sudden he hit a Saturn return and they didn't plan on having more children, but then there was a, they had a third child unexpectedly and it was like kind of a surprise and kind of initially at least not a welcome one because it became they weren't in a good position financially. So it was like a really rough couple of years getting through that. Um, but then they did. And that's, you know, different of an experience where broadly or archetypally they're still going through something difficult at that time, but it's not um, that sort of extreme scenario necessarily, just in terms of speaking to your earlier point about um, sometimes being able to focus more on the archetype of identifying an area of possible difficulty or challenges without necessarily always going into the specifics of what it could have been, or at least letting the client themselves speak to the specifics of what it was. Yeah, exactly. Like we couldn't sit down with those two clients or people who are theoretically clients and say like, okay, well you have Saturn in the fifth and you have a night chart. So that means this is going to happen to you when you start having children. Like we can't necessarily be that prescriptive about it unless there are like 10 other things like loudly screaming about something in particular. Sometimes you can zero in, but we do know that like Saturn in the fifth and a night chart is not going to be like, there's going to be some challenge around their experience of like children or their creative process or whatever it may be. And so uh, we can talk to them about like how we can support them in that part of their life without even necessarily like knowing exactly what they've been through. Yeah, and I and I do want to say to like go back around to an earlier discussion point that that is the useful part in the revival of traditional astrology and ancient forms of astrology is the ability sometimes to zero in a little bit better with a little bit more technical sophistication on the parts that could be more challenging or even more easier positive, and that is you know super useful and it allows us to use distinctions where. I think earlier in modern astrology, because there was so much of an emphasis on trying to not harm clients and be overly fatalistic or negative, um, they sort of did away with a lot of technical distinctions, including things like benefic and malefic. Um, but a lot of the process over the past decade or two has been recovering some of those things and figuring out how to use them in a way that's um, better and more effective technically, while also still at the same time being uh, careful and cognizant or conscientious about our application of those techniques. Totally. And in this weird way, like the more I studied traditional astrology, like the more of a fatalist I became, where <laughs> I was just like, well, are we making any choices? But there was something like extremely comforting about it as well in, in understanding um, those more nuanced techniques and knowing like, okay, well, 
modern astrology initially gave me this sort of sense of like, I can overcome anything or like, you know, all, all challenges I can endure. Like uh, I'm also a very like Saturnian person. So I kind of like have that in me anyways. Uh, but then integrating some of the traditional techniques was really comforting in challenges in my life that, uh, remain challenging and things that I recognize like, Oh, this is just a really difficult piece. Like there is nothing that I could done or could not have done that would have like avoided this. This is just like a difficult part of my experience essentially. And so I think in that way, it can actually be very validating as well. Yeah, because it actually is able to more clearly speak to the person's actual lived experience as opposed to rejecting that and saying that, you know, that that's not important or that you didn't experience difficulty in that area. Sometimes the client or even an astrologer's ability to acknowledge the areas of difficulty in a person's life is the most helpful and useful thing because then it does give an access point for being able to work through some of those things or help or heal them to whatever extent that you can. Absolutely. Yeah. And like, given the example that you shared, it's like, we can safely say there's nothing that your dad could have done or could not have done that would have like avoided the loss of a child. But then to talk to you as a person who's part of that family system and who's also impacted by that experience, it's like, okay, well, uh, in, in what way can you, um, engage with Saturn in your life in a way that might be like somewhat liberating from that story or, or to, to sort of integrate it a little bit more where possible. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I actually just realized it's, it's his birthday tomorrow, and I've never shared his oh. chart, so I'm going to just flash the chart really quickly as a matter of a, a thing there. So there's the chart with Cancer rising and that big stellium of four planets in Scorpio with Mercury, Saturn, the Sun, and Venus there. So, And then my Saturn is at 17 degrees of Scorpio, so it's pretty close to his exact Saturn return um, in a night chart. So. That brings up something though, which is a funny thing I always noticed as soon as I got into astrology, which is, uh, and I think I talked about this in a previous episode with Lynn Bell on family dynamics and threads, where sometimes you'll see repeating astrological patterns that go across generations. And the one that was funny in my life is just, you know, I'm I was born with the sun in Scorpio. Uh, my mom was born two days later with the sun in Scorpio. My dad was born with the sun in Scorpio. And then my grandfather, my mother's father, was also born with the sun in Scorpio on the same birthday as her. So we have this like weird pattern of intergenerational Scorpio transits. And I think that kind of brings us back around to you know, our main topic and your your take on it, which is that's not the full access point, but that's like a little mini version to some extent, I think, of part of what you're talking about with applying astrology to intergenerational themes, right? Exactly. Yeah. Because uh, I find that trying to just be like, okay, like we all have intergenerational trauma, like what is it and what do we do with it? Like it's so massive. <laughs> and also like we want to approach trauma work with some element of caution, like, and maybe making sure that we have like little pieces that we can work with one at a time. So we don't like totally overwhelm ourselves with these like huge difficult things. And so looking at astrology in that way can be like a really helpful, clear access point and be like, okay, I know that there's some intergenerational stuff I'm working with that relates to my family. Maybe it's hard to pinpoint what that is. And so you start looking at family charts in that way and, and noticing those kind of correlations like, oh, okay, like six of us have our son at the same degree of Scorpio and like, okay, what does that mean? So that's going to give you so much information about some of the themes that you're working with. And that's just looking at like one, uh, well, one luminary in the chart. And so when you start to see like those kinds of threads, I think it gives you a lot of helpful information about what you might personally be uh, connected to in your family story versus someone else. And, you know, if you look at different sibling charts, obviously 
there's going to be some correlation, but they're like completely different people. And so it's like one sibling might really be carrying like this part of the story and another sibling is like the black sheep and they're carrying this part of the story. And so you can kind of see the way different people are expressing these different pieces of these like ancestral themes that can go way back. I don't actually have um, any birth data for people in my family past my grandparents, but I'm sure if I did, uh, it would show the same kind of parallels that I can see in the charts that I do have. Do you Did you notice anything like that when you got into astrology about little things that were repeating patterns in just your own family or family unit? Yeah, definitely. Um, there are some really common themes in my family charts where there are just like rep uh, my brother and my dad have similar charts, but like reversed, like they're each other's like seventh house, essentially. Right. <laughs> and um, there's a really common thread with uh, similar moon signs. And um, I also have noticed with myself and a lot of clients that people will often have um, like the moon sign of their mother's sun sign or something like that, where it's like the moon is quite literally their mother, like the, the, like if someone has like their moon in Libra and then their mother has sun in Libra, something like that, where it's, it's just like, then the moon in their chart is quite literally, uh, some indication of like their mother's personality. Um, but often people will have like threads of repeated aspects. Like you might see a family that has, um, a repeated Mercury square Pluto aspect or something like that. And then that's going to give you a lot of information about some of the particular themes in that family that they're working with around um, like expression or like uh, repression or things that are like buried in the psyche. Yeah. Cause we all, you know, sort of grow up knowing that or learning that of like, Oh, I got that personality trait from that person or this personality trait from another, but then seeing it almost objectively sometimes through the birth charts is really fascinating. I think that's one of the initial hooks for astrology is being able to sort of identify from a different perspective some of those traits that get passed on. Yeah, absolutely. And I I think it's also um yeah, just like a helpful manageable way to start to digest some of those trauma pieces because um, I find that looking at it astrologically can just be a little more digestible than than trying to like grasp the whole concept at once, I guess. Mm, okay, that makes sense. Um, all right, so we're talking at this point about explaining the connection between intergenerational theory and the planets, and we're talking a little bit more locally right now about the initial family unit, but this also can be expanded more broadly to um, earlier generations or, or larger generations of people, right? Yeah, absolutely. And um, talking about like personal imprints that we might have in our chart versus like uh, things that that might relate to in our family systems, we can do that with like broader experiences as well. So um, obviously there's a whole generation of people that were born during the Uranus-Pluto conjunction in the late 60s. And um, so they have that personally in their chart, but they were born during a particular time and sort of like a movement that was happening in the world, especially depending on where they were born. Um, so really anyone who was like like born in North America at that time, there was like a huge uh, kind of um, like rights movement that was going on that those people then have that signature in their chart. And so it's beautiful to also look at like the more collective context of the things that people have in their chart, because then we're looking at intergenerational themes, not just like in our personal families and in our ancestry, but also like the things that we're connected to in a broader sense sense. Um, and like, for instance, I'm born, uh, like middle, late eighties ish. And it's like the climate crisis was like just becoming apparent at that time. Um, and, and now as an adult, like that's become a large part of my like work and focus and something that I care about. And so that is also like an intergenerational theme to me because it's something that I was born into that obviously like, uh, it was largely out of my control at the time of my birth, but is something that impacts me and is part of my story and, and my focus and my work.
that makes sense. Um, and I like that example you gave also of the, of the 60s because it was, it was such a tumultuous decade and there was just like so much going on with like civil rights, with uh, politics, you know, there was like assassinations of like people left and right in the US and, and other places. Um, there was a lot of in like pop culture and like music and everything else, like just like rapid changes. Um, yeah, just pretty much across the board. And then on the one hand, you have people that were experienced in that, that were alive at the time as adults or, or younger people and their experience of those large scale generational transits and just the feeling of what was in the air at the time, which was reflected by things like Uranus conjunct Pluto and Virgo. But then you also have people that were born into that and therefore get that signature baked into their charts and then later go on and grow up and almost become like like avatars of that generational transit in some way in the future. Um, so that's really interesting to think about. And I think that's part of what got you started in this research, right? Was paying attention to some of the transits, the big ones that were going on over the past few years and how that related um, to your family to some extent. Yeah, actually, it was almost like this accidental process that came out of the uh, recent Saturn Uranus square that we've been going through since early 2021. And um I was born like fairly close to the conjunction in the late 80s. And so it's something that is sort of like part of my personal story in some ways, like that Saturn Uranus conjunction. Uh, but then when the square started heating up and I was looking at, uh, yeah, here we go. This is this is what we've been doing. <laughs> yeah, lastly. this has been the, the story <laughs> for a little bit. Doing it. Yeah. So, so just yeah. for the audio listeners were looking at a graph from Archetypal Explorer that just shows, um, sort of put on a graph, the Saturn Uranus square where there's been three hits over the past few years, um, starting in 2021, going into most recently, it came back and got really close to going exact again, but didn't quite. But I think we've been feeling it here in the later part of 2022. Um, yeah, but that's been one of the mo more intense outer planet alignments the past few years. Mm hmm. Yeah. And so I knew like, OK, as a person who has this conjunction in my chart, more or less, um, I'm going to feel this maybe a little bit differently from someone who has no aspect between Saturn and Uranus. Uh, and, and sure enough, it ended up being this kind of surprising journey. Like I, I mentioned earlier that I come from a family of Holocaust survivors and um, I ended up uncovering this uh, tape that my grandfather had done with the USC Shoah Foundation, which essentially like um, interviewed as many Holocaust survivors as possible in the 90s to document their stories. And uh, my family knew that he had done this tape, but for whatever reason, like half of it was lost. And it was the whole period between like 1935 and 1945 that somehow got lost. And uh, during the Saturn Uranus square, I ended up like finding this uh, remaining part of the tape that documents his experience during the Holocaust. And um, it, it sparked a lot of process for me and thinking about like the connection between that and then going through the closing square of a cycle that began when I was born and then starting to look back at some of the earlier Saturn Uranus dates and like starting to do research around it. It was just like, I don't know if you have these moments with astrology where it's just kind of like, I don't know, blowing the roof off or something or just like the specific correlations of the dates with some of the themes that are unfolding. So for me, like looking at my personal relationship with some of the larger collective themes happening during the Saturn Uranus cycle has been like a significant part of developing this work and this research. And then I started looking into like other planetary cycles and and some of the mundane astrology dates that uh, line up with it. And it was like, okay, it fits from every angle, essentially. <laughs> okay. So, and so part of it was realizing that there might be some sort of like Saturn Uranus signature that was keyed into your family's um, story in some way. And as you went back and started looking at that, you were, you were looking at and, and you're grandfather's story, 
um, you realize that there was a Saturn Uranus alignment of a, of a conjunction during that time period that he was talking about, that he was sharing that story from like the late 1930s or early 1940s. Yeah, exactly. When I went through my family charts, I didn't necessarily see um, such strong Saturn Uranus themes with other people in my family, which actually kind of makes sense because I'm the one that's been sort of doing a lot of this research. Uh, and but then when I looked at like the actual um, dates around World War II and and some of the stop and start around it or like the building around it and then some of the kind of uh, markers of what followed the Second World War, there I noticed Saturn Uranus dates. And so it was more like I felt personally connected to that time period in an intergenerational way, I guess, like the, the link was through my family experience, but then it also, um, sparked a lot of thought for me around like, yeah, how I, uh, feel personally interested to, to learn more and do as much, uh, research and integration of some of what was happening during that time period as possible. Cause it's almost like personal to me because it's part of my chart. Right. That makes sense. Um, yeah, and the Saturn Uranus has been intense over the past couple of years, and um, that's a cycle. I don't know if you want to, if we should follow that thread through and talk about some past alignments with that cycle, or if um, I know we needed to do some setup talking a little bit about planetary myths and the relevance of that at some point, right? Yeah, maybe it's helpful to talk about the myth because I feel like that's a lot of the context for this as well and think and like why I started thinking about astrology and family systems other than just my personal experience it might kind of help lay some groundwork for us to come back to some of those dates later okay yeah um I I don't know if I did maybe I did an episode but it might be best to assume that I didn't what is the relationship or why are myths important in relation to astrology yeah um I kind of think of them as like, yeah, very foundational to like what astrology essentially is, which as far as we understand, essentially began with people just like looking up at the sky and being like, what's happening? <laughs> Something is moving or changing. And then noticing correlation between that and different events that were happening on earth. Um, and so the myths themselves are the stories that people developed to explain what they were seeing in the sky. Um, and so, uh, depending on the time period or the culture that you're looking at it from, um, people might have thought that the planets themselves were deities that had their own kind of like personality or agency. Um, or it might have been that, um, they, they were sort of like, uh, 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 mouthpieces of God or of some kind of higher being that were then influencing what was happening on the earth. Um, and so if you look at any time period in astrology, there's some sort of uh, set of myths that is associated with them. And so um, I, as I was thinking about some of these intergenerational themes, I started to realize like, um, wait, wait a second, the stories that are connected with the planets are family stories. And a lot of the practice that I'm working from is using some of the traditional Greek myths. Uh, so maybe it's just helpful to say that for this episode, because I, I think you could like look into any set of mythology from different time periods and cultures that have been practicing astrology. Um, and that would also be an interesting way to do it. But just for the sake of this conversation, we'll sort of talk about the Greek myths. Um, and yeah, all of the- especially because there was a deliberate attempt to, you know, in the Mesopotamian tradition where Western astrology originated to assign gods um, to certain planets in a way that spoke to what they thought the planets actually meant and that there was a connection between 
the astrological meaning of a planet and the myth that was associated with it. And then when the Greeks and the Romans came along later, there was a deliberate attempt to find gods in their own pantheon and assign the, the same god or a god that had an appropriate meaning to the same planet so that there was like a, a connection there from, from a very early stage. Yeah, exactly. And so starting to think about like what that connection is between like the planets and the gods that have been assigned to them. Um, I, I feel like it had not really sunk in until like the last few years of my practice that we're just like looking at a family tree, essentially. It's like, I knew that, but then it, it was one of those like aha moments. Cause I had been also in the background thinking about all this intergenerational stuff, um, and already sort of like using astrology through like a, a healing or trying to use it through a very trauma-informed lens. And then it was like something kind of crystallized for me of being like, oh, wait a second. Yeah, this is just like um, essentially uh, an intergenerational trauma that's happening in the, the planetary gods as well. And, and it sort of clicked in for me that way. And all of the planets, like if we're looking at the Greek myths, all of the planets and both of the luminaries are part of the same family. So it's actually quite fascinating to like look at that as like an intergenerational system um, in the same way that we are looking at it as like a solar system or like this sort of related um, set of planetary bodies. All right. So one of the things I think it might be good to talk about as we're getting into myths is just the idea that myths aren't just stories, but that they actually represent archetypes or broader dynamics or broader truths um, about things that happen in the world that are just put into sort of story form. And that connection with myths being grounded in archetypes may actually be the reason why they're really helpful and useful when it comes to astrology, since astrology also works through the use, the use of archetypes and metaphors and symbolism. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's interesting to think about that if people are ever like investigating uh, the different myths through the different time periods and cultures because it changes slightly. Like if you look at all of the different stories about Mars through different time periods, uh, it will change based on like the the culture and, and who's telling that story at what time. And so I think it says a lot about like um, how those archetypes are like taking shape at that time and place. Like for instance, some of the myths around Mars uh, might show Mars as just like a completely destructive, like um, unbearable force that can't be reckoned with. And other times Mars is more like someone who will go to war in the name of peace. And there, there's this sense of like ultimate resolution or outcome with Mars. And I think that it's, you know, we're looking at the same archetype there, but the different versions of it uh, tell us a lot about the time period and the culture that those particular stories are coming out of. Yeah, for sure. And, and to some extent, being culturally relative in, on the one hand, but then on the other hand, sometimes also still containing in a way some like universal truths that are being passed down that are still relevant because they're tapping into a universal archetype in some way. Yeah, absolutely. Like in all of the stories, Mars is still Marsing, but it's just going to do it in, in different ways or have like different levels of like agency in those stories, depending on the culture. Right. Um, so maybe it would be useful to talk a little bit about some of the um, the myths or some of the gods connected with some of the planets just to give a taste or, or a little understanding of how that works to some extent. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have this kind of family system in the Greek myths that involve all of the planets as well as the luminaries. And um, I'm definitely including the outer planets here because um, I, I think it's, it's certainly relevant to the myths. So it sort of starts with Uranus at the top as like the original sky daddy. Um, and uh, yeah, here we have our like super fun <laughs> family chart. <laughs> um, and 
Uranus was married to Gaia, who we could consider to be like planet Earth, if we're going to involve planet Earth in this representation. And Uranus and Gaia fathered the 12 Titans. Um, and uh, Uranus was considered to be this like very cruel ruler that was um, impossible to uh, contend with. And he had this sort of like ultimate control over everything and everyone. And, and then all of a sudden he has 12 children who, you know, they're the Titans. They're like incredibly powerful in and of themselves. And so he's, he feels a little threatened by them. So he decides to banish them all to Tartarus, uh, which is a very dark place full of horrible suffering. <laughs> um, and so Kronos, who, uh, is the, uh, God that corresponds with the planet Saturn, is the last of the Titans and one of Uranus's children. And um, so even, I just always think it's funny to think about Saturn as the planet that grew up in like a cold, dark place full of suffering, because I think that tells us so much about um, where some of the delineations of Saturn came from, even just that it's like uh, in charge of the winter signs and Tartarus is like a place where there's no light. Um mm. But uh, anyway, so Gaia is like, okay, Uranus is out of control. I need to get one of our children to deal with him. And Kronos is the only one who can be convinced to do something about it. So Gaia convinces Kronos to return uh, and he castrates his father to sort of demasculate him and uh, take power. And when Uranus's testicles fall into the sea, from the foam that occurs, Aphrodite is born. So uh, take from that what you will about like what that means for Venus as like a kind of origin story um, that she essentially comes from this um, battle of the cruel patriarchs and the emasculation of one. Mm -hmm. So Kronos returns, castrates his father, um, and now he's in charge and he's like the big sky daddy. Uh, and he begins his own cruel reign that is essentially like not very different from the way his father was. And uh, and then he begins to have his own children um, with his sister slash wife, Rhea, <laughs> uh, and they father the first of the Olympians. And... Um, there are several Olympians, but amongst them are Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus, which would be Pluto, Neptune, and Jupiter, um, if we're thinking about planetary correspondence. And uh, so there's this prophecy that's going around when Kronos is in power that his children are also going to overthrow him, which he does not like because he doesn't want to lose control. And so he's like, okay, well, I'll just eat my children as soon as they're born and then they can't do anything. Um, and so one by one, he swallows his children at their births. And uh, that's a pretty and, good plan. I mean, honestly, like it worked for him up until a certain point. <laughs> I, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. And there's uh, all kinds of like famous art about Saturn eating his children. I can't remember the name of the painter, but there's like, one particularly iconic painting of Saturn just like going to town on a baby and like ripping it apart. Um, but it really did work for him for a while. Like he had, uh, what was it? One, two, three, four, five children that he effectively ate and like stayed in control. <laughs> uh, eventually Rhea is like very sick of this. And so when she gets pregnant with Zeus, she goes into hiding throughout her pregnancy and gives birth to Zeus um, in this like hidden place. And she returns and hands Kronos a rock wrapped in a blanket instead of baby Zeus. And Kronos is like, yeah, and like thinks he's eating Zeus, but it's just a rock. Um, and so Zeus sort of successfully like escapes this um, uh, nice family theme that's been happening for the rest of the Olympians. And he's raised in a kind of like hidden realm away from Kronos. And then when Zeus comes of age, he's like, it's my destiny to overthrow my father. So like already we can see some parallels happening here, <laughs> like the sons being like banished and then returning to overthrow their father. Yeah. Like a running theme of like 
paranoia and then also yeah returning and overthrowing the the patriarch yeah like each one being like it's my power now and then um their child being like no i'm gonna destroy you so that it can be my power now instead of just like maybe trying a different approach whatever that would have been um (laughs) So Zeus returns and challenges Kronos and uh, tricks him into like ingesting this poison. And then uh, Kronos proceeds to like vomit up his children one by one. And um, so I also think it's funny to think about how Hades ruler of the underworld was like the first in and the last out in his like deep, dark time in Saturn's belly. I feel like that's very representative. Um, But anyways, this is like a victorious moment for Zeus. And then he becomes the king of Olympus and like the ultimate sky daddy who, uh, like, as far as we can see, is like basically the same as his dad anyways. Um, And Zeus goes on to have like many affairs and children. Like, I honestly don't even uh, think I know all of the archetypes that are children of Zeus because (laughs) there's so many of them. But among them were um, the twins Apollo and Artemis, which we can consider to be like the sun and the moon. And Apollo is like the god of the arts and and prophecy and medicine. And Artemis is uh, this virgin goddess of hunting in the wild. And she's like in myth known for being like fiercely protective of her chastity, um, which again, like, Take from that what you will of being born to Zeus, who is like also known for um, assaulting different goddesses and and sort of just having his way. And uh, so Apollo and Artemis are two of his children, and that's the sun and the moon. And then um, there's also Hermes, who is uh, the the correspondent with Mercury, and Hermes is the trickster. And there's sort of this uh, famous story of Hermes like growing at a ridiculous speed as soon as he's born and crawling away as a baby um, to like explore the world. And he creates uh, this lyre from a turtle shell um, and then steals all of Apollo's cattle. And Zeus is like, give that back. (laughs) You can't take all those cows. Um, And Hermes convinces uh, Apollo to take the lyre instead of um, the cattle. And that's actually how uh, Apollo becomes such a like proficient musician. And, and he's like forever seen like walking around with this, I guess it's, it's kind of like a version of a lute or something like that, like a little stringed instrument. Um, and so these are kind of like sibling, sibling issues that are coming up amongst them. And, uh, the last children, child of Zeus to point out would be Ares, um, who in, in this version of Mars archetypes that we were talking about, like for the Greeks, Ares was like a purely antagonistic force. (laughs) There was no, like, um, there was no catharsis with this version of Mars. He just tends to side with, uh, the opposing side just for the sake of it. And is always kind of like being humiliated and like winding up losing at one point, I think in like the battle with the Trojans, he gets injured and he goes to Zeus and he's like, dad, I hurt myself. And Zeus is like, Oh, like if we weren't blood related, I would cast you out or something like that. Um, so anyways, this is, this is like a family story that we are telling. And, um, Yeah, there's a lot of family dynamics that are very real, present, like family dynamics that actually come up, even though it's told in sort of like a fantastical way. It's obviously relaying things that are like people's actual experiences with different types of family, not just dynamics, but also dysfunction. And even here, we can see the idea of passing down some of those dysfunctions, you know, across generations, like one of the themes with some of the top ones was like becoming the things that you hate about your parents. Um, Or you have issues of like Zeus, like sleeping around and and that being like an issue um, on the part of the father or what have you. 
Exactly. Yeah. Like there's a very clear correlation between like the Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter part of the line where it's like um, cruel, destructive patriarchs who sort of cast out or disown their children. And then those children returning to be like the good and, and to overcome the evil of their father, but then essentially just like stepping right back into that role themselves. And then that interesting parallel between um, Zeus's uh, very like assaulting nature and a lot of the harm that he causes to different uh, women and goddesses through these different myths. And then having a daughter um, who is uh, said to like almost violently protect her chastity or her virginity um, as a result of having a father who uh, is so aggressive about taking that from others. And so it's really quite mind blowing to think about it as just like a dysfunctional family story, because if you change the details or the circumstances, you could basically just tell this story as like a modern day dysfunctional story of like someone with like a very cruel, abusive, controlling father who then grows up to like become that himself and then his children, this and that and, and so on and so forth. So right, um, it's literally like an yeah. outline for like a five season, like Netflix show <laughs> that everybody would be watching and would have a cliffhanger at the end of each season. Exactly. Like, I'm pretty sure This Is Us is just like a version of um, the planetary myths or something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or now um, Shameless might actually be like a better example of that. <laughs> yeah. Or I was thinking like Game of Thrones or something because it gets a little CD, a little HBO-ish at, at times. Yeah. Game of Thrones is almost like a direct version of this. And then there's probably like some dragons that come out of the Greek myths as well, I'm sure. <laughs> right. Um, so those were the gods. And then there's a separate tree graphic that you made here that just more directly shows the planetary correspondences. Yeah. Yeah. So this is like the same way of looking at it, but like as the planets themselves and Venus is kind of like, I don't know, she's doing her own thing over there because she's not exactly a child of Uranus or Saturn, um, but is like born of their battle, I guess. Um, maybe I, I don't know if she would even be like technically related to Uranus comes from his testicles somehow. Right. So for the audio listeners, it's like a, a tree with Uranus at the top and then below it is Saturn to the left is Venus. And then below Saturn, we get Jupiter, Neptune, and Pluto. And then from Jupiter, we get the Sun, Moon, Mars, and Mercury. So that really is like most of pretty much most of the planets basically that we use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even if you were to look at um, the asteroids, they're, they're somewhat in there as well. I just... Um, haven't like sorted all the details of them as exactly, but um, like all of those uh, asteroid archetypes are part of this family tree as well, just more more like proximally. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. So we can see then a lot of basic um, things like dysfunctions coming up through just looking at this family tree and some of the dynamics involved and a lot of like broader themes that are still very much relevant to us today, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And to your earlier point about myth being this uh, like uh, sort of archetypal lens that we have, these are some of like the original stories that we have about humanity or about human experience, like with astrology, at least we can trace this back about 4,000 years. And it's like, these are stories that we've been telling ourselves about human experience for at least 4,000 years now. Um, and I think it's a very interesting correlation and not a mistake that it almost exactly resembles like the continued story of human family systems and the, the kind of like dysfunction and intergenerational transfer that happens in our family systems. Yeah. And that, you know, that's really important because it shows the connection between modern and ancient times and how things aren't 
that different in terms of some of the core dynamics today. And that was the big surprise for me when I got into studying ancient astrology. Is I, you know, famously like told a story of going to Kepler uh, that I always tell and wanting to study modern astrology and and only studying modern astrology for the first four years of my studies. And then they pretty much like forced me to take this class on ancient astrology. And I tried to protest and get out of it because I thought it wasn't relevant. I thought studying astrology from 2000 years ago was not going to have any relevance or usefulness to today um, because I had this conception that we'd grown so much in terms of like civilization and, and dynamics and everything was so different and we had new planets that they didn't even know about 2000 years ago and how could that be useful or relevant and it turns out that actually it was useful and relevant because life today and some of the core dynamics of life and the things that people experience is actually so similar in terms of its fundamentals um, today to the way it was 2000 years ago that a system of astrology that was developed 2000 years ago that's why it's still around today because it spoke to or it did a good job of speaking to some of those core principles that are still very much present and with us in life today and many of the dynamics in life are still very much the same absolutely yeah and i feel like that is exactly like how intergenerational theory works and i also like as a younger person uh with a certain kind of like hope for humanity would always be like okay humanity is making progress and you know this and that has changed and we're in such a different place than we were several thousand right. years ago yeah <laughs> it's like the more i learned i was like oh okay <laughs> And starting to see that, like, the, like we are in some ways, like exactly where we were four thousand years ago, and you, you know, we still have war, we still have dehumanization, we still have like constant struggle over like this idea of ownership over land, and and all of these different themes that were there right from the beginning, and so yeah. yeah. The past few years in particular of just like events happening in the world has made me really open my eyes and realize that some of the things that we thought were things of the past or things, especially like bad things that we we learned and grown grown from collectively as humanity, that those things really aren't in the past. Even like, you know, plagues, like we just had a great crash course over the past couple of years that like plagues can still break out and just like kill millions of people. And that the sort of technology and other things that we have, it doesn't um, make humanity immune to those things or any less susceptible at this point. I mean, I guess, you know, obviously there's a counterpoint to that in terms of the development of ways to fight that and some of the amazing technological advances, but just the idea that we're still dealing with things like that. Um, yeah, and a number of other things over the past few years. I don't know if that's been your experience as well, but it's been one of my experiences recently. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I used to have this idea of um, progress that was maybe kind of like linear, like, okay, we are making this progress and we're heading in this direction. And actually it's been like practicing astrology over such a long period of time that has changed my mind about that <laughs> because um, it, it's... It, placed it in more of like a circular context than a linear context. Like um, progress is maybe something that's just like moving from one place in a cycle to another place in a cycle, but the cycle itself is still there. And it does actually make me think about these myths as well, because like um, Saturn probably thought he was making progress by overthrowing his father and like doing things his way. And like Zeus probably thought the same thing. And so there's this kind of like false notion of things moving ahead by triumphing over some existing evil. And I actually think that's like a very uh, sort of colonial perspective of thinking, which makes sense that it would be like part of these Greek myths as well. And so now I'm more like, we exist in these larger cycles that are happening and less like we're trying to get from point A to point B because I, I don't know that we can necessarily as like human beings. Yeah, that was something I struggled with when I first learned <clears throat> the history of astrology at, at Kepler. One of my main history teachers was Nick Campion, Nicholas Campion, and he was always very down on 
what he called like the myth of progress and the idea that things just always inevitably get better and always go on this straight sort of linear path upwards. And he always said, uh, you know, no, that's not true, or that's not always true. Sometimes things can go backwards, things can like rise and fall, and um, it's not always moving in a specific direction. And I still have some reservations about that to a certain extent, but then I've really understood over the course of the past decade or the past several years that things really um, can move backwards sometimes, and it's not always this really clean uphill thing that we always think of it as. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think about that a lot too. And it's sort of like a tricky balance because I can also think about a lot of examples of things that have like changed dramatically over the course of history, even things like civil rights movements and, and women's rights and like the legalization of like queer marriage and gender affirming healthcare, like these are things that feel like, um, like a massive kind of progress as well. But then as we've seen in recent times, it's like, it also may unfortunately not be a stopping point. Like it, there, there may still be more that unfolds from there. It's not necessarily like a, a final place of landing, even though it is also like, um, like a beacon of hope and change at the same time. Yeah. That makes me think of, um, there's like a famous, there's been a few versions of this, but you'll see sometimes like I know Tad Man illustrated one in the like 1960s or 70s. And then more recently, there was that astrology documentary that came out earlier this year that did like an animated version. But if you imagine our solar system that has the planets, you know, spinning around the sun and doing their cycles, that you have the individual cycles of the planets, but then that the solar system is moving forward in time at the same time, like all together, so that it creates more like a spiral. So that um, you have the planetary cycle, which is where things there, there's repetitions and things stay the same, but then also there's the spiral of the forward movement. So that there's also progress in sort of like a, another like third direction or third dimension in some ways. Mm, yeah, that's really beautiful. I uh, often think about the spiral as a more like representative image of like human pathways than anything. And, and that, like a spiral is like somewhat directional, like it's not just moving in a circle necessarily. Um, but it, it's certainly a different way of understanding our experience than like a straight line, which is very much like there's some kind of goal or destination at the end of it. I also love the spiral because there's like a sense of something deepening or like getting closer to a center, whatever that may be. Yeah, for sure. So it's this diagram I've got just from the thumbnail for the video viewers of from the Changing of the Gods documentary. And there's just like a still that shows the planets moving around the sun in like a circle, but then they're also moving forward in time, which creates this elongated spiral. Um, maybe that's a good middle ground for thinking about the idea of progress or the myth of progress that on the one hand you have things where there's always going to be a repetition of certain themes on their individual cycles like the Saturn cycle but then the it's also elongated because it's moving in a specific direction uh, at the same time absolutely and like isn't that what we're doing with astrology in the first place to like use it to understand how our experience works or like make meaning of our experience. So it would make a lot more sense that our human cycles mirror the path of the planets in the sky more so than like thinking that we work like a straight line, whereas the planets are moving in this more cyclical way. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That makes a lot of sense to me. And it also brings up though that things don't just move forward and continue continue moving forward permanently unless people continue to push for change and push for progress and if that doesn't happen then the issue is that things can very easily relapse or fall back into a, a, a state from earlier where things maybe weren't as good for certain people um, I mean that was one of the things that's come up over the past month that was really shocking to me was the rise, you know, with some of like Kanye West's statements of like anti-Semitism and stuff and things that I thought 
you know, we had like learned from and and like were things of the past, but it, it really brought back the realization that um, things have not changed as much, or at least there's the potential for things to go back to like a darker place from like the 1930s or 1940s if people aren't reminded or, or don't continue to push for like progress and change in a, like a positive direction. Absolutely. And I think that maybe like in the early stages of realizing how connected these things are and also how cyclical they are, sometimes people experience despair around that. Like, well, there's no point in doing anything if things are just going to be like this anyways. But mm -hmm. um, we are actually like a significant part of that, like you're saying. And, um, you know, thinking back to, we were talking about like the Uranus-Pluto conjunction in the 60s and like the civil rights movement. It's like there was a planetary alignment happening at that time, but like the movement of what was happening in humanity was a, a big part of what made that what it was. And that was like people protesting and, and pushing back and pushing for change. And, um, you know, to your, to your point about, um, Kanye and, and like some of the pieces of antisemitism that are still present, it's like the only thing that genocide researchers tend to agree on is that one of the most effective tools for like stopping genocide in its early stages before it's really snowballed is protest and um, for people to essentially have some way to signal that like they see what's happening and they do not agree with it and so like these choices that we make absolutely have an impact it's just that they are also connected to larger systems and cycles that can be somewhat out of our control, um, but we're still part of the the sort of process that unfolds with them. I think. Yeah, for sure, and and also just a remembering of history and the, and the importance of passing down history, which interestingly brings us back to our topic in terms of passing down history between generations, because otherwise there can be a forgetting of things that are important. And almost in some ways, I wonder if myths sometimes serve that function in passing down like a core truth that needs to be remembered um, in a way that can survive um, the individual lives, the lives of individuals and how short they are by passing on something that's timeless in a way that, that can be preserved. Yes, absolutely. I think myth can be a really important way of, of um, helping people remember history and also remember their sort of agency within their communities and their cultures. And um, certainly I would say that indigenous cultures have uh, like a, a much stronger, more grounded way of like weaving that into their perspective. Um, that a lot of the time there will be this perspective of like seven generations before and seven gen generations after and immediately placing each individual like in a context of both their ancestors as well as the generations still yet to be born um, and, and using myth and story as a really foundational way of, um, you know, raising their children and, and building community and connection because it helps to remind people that they are part of something that is greater than just themselves. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And, and just the idea of you know, in terms of like pre-modern cultures, like how to pass on important lessons and important things that humanity had learned collectively prior to like the invention of like movies or, or podcasts or, or other things like that is, is you pass it on through stories and through the oral or sometimes eventually like written passing down of, of these things through generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like our talk about epigenetics earlier, it's like, we know we're going to be passing something on. <laughs> so we might as well like contribute to that in a way that can also be like very empowering and, and grounding and like offer some kind of like um, helpful tool or information and into what we're passing on as well. Yeah. Cause there's some like implicit like moral lessons about some of those stories that you were telling earlier. Like for example, in the what was happening between Uranus and Saturn, and then that was repeated from Saturn to Jupiter, and 
um, those lessons about like you know becoming trying to overthrow the existing establishment, but then becoming what you hate or something like that that were sort of implicit like moral stories that somebody could just take the myths on the surface level as being stories that are almost a little like entertaining, but then that they had deeper ma- meanings perhaps that were meant to be passed on. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe in some ways, like cautionary tales about um, becoming disconnected in our relationship to to power and or like uh, being more compassionate towards our children and our family systems. And um, yeah, there's also a lot of information in those stories, obviously, about like the role of uh, women that seem to have this kind of like peripheral context in the myths, but are actually the ones like instigating the disruption of power and control and and sort of like um, arranging these shifts or changes that happen generationally as well. Right, for sure. Um, So some of this comes up with planetary cycles and the repetitive nature of planetary cycles and how that ties in potentially with different ancestral and other family cycles. And I think part of your work and part of your premise or thesis that we're sort of focusing on here is the idea that sometimes some of these signatures, the different planetary signatures can relate to different myths and different dynamics from some of those um, planetary or, or family dynamics and myths, but also that some of these signatures can be studied potentially more specifically within the context of different planetary alignments, especially outer planet ones. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously, like um, looking at planetary cycles is not like a new perspective in astrology, but it's something that I've always been very interested in, like early on with my study. Um, And then in, in the last three or four years or so, thinking more about some of these intergenerational themes and wondering like how that relates to the planetary cycles, I started to notice connections between the cycles and the like archetypes of the like personalities in the myths essentially um or things that were between specific planets might have some kind of like correlation or echo of the myth around those planets or or some like connection to the story itself and so uh it's been a big part of the research that i've been doing to like um look at the different uh planetary cycles throughout like the last hundred or so years and then try to correlate what's happening there with um some some expression of the myth and it's it's kind of like shocking to to do that work because it's almost like a direct iteration of these like mythical family stories just essentially like playing out through the planetary cycles when we look at the actual dates throughout history okay um do you want to let's talk about do you have some examples Yeah, totally. Um, So I had mentioned that um, some of my research and work with this has been largely focused on uh, World War II and and some of the connection with the Holocaust, because that is something that is personal to my experience. Um, But it also, I think, uh, was uh, a way to just sort of like ground some of the examples for our conversation. So I had been curious to look at uh, like what was happening astrologically during the time period of the Second World War. Um, and then also to see like what the echoes were from those cycles, like in where we are now and trying to piece together like some of the correlations of what's happening now with what may have been happening at that time. Okay. And over the past few years, like we've talked about, there's like the Saturn Uranus square that's been happening. We've also had the Saturn Pluto conjunction, which was pretty major in 2020. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I was trying to sort of just look at, I mean, we've had so many like major <laughs> planetary conjunctions. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, but yeah, mostly the um, the Saturn Pluto conjunction in 2020 and then the Saturn Uranus square over the last, uh, it's almost two years now that they've been um, aspecting each other. Um, and then I also was looking at like the Jupiter Pluto cycle and the Jupiter Neptune cycle and some of the other conjunctions, but that gets to be a lot of information to sort of like go through in the examples. So mostly 
Saturn, Uranus, and Pluto for this conversation, which we can think of as like grandfather, father, uh, son, grandchild, if we're thinking about it like intergenerationally in that way. Do you want to go into some uh, some of the examples from that time frame, or do you feel like going going into some of that from the World War II time frame right now? Yeah. So trying to sort of go back a little bit just before the war, um, there was a, a closing Saturn-Uranus square, uh, which would have been um, Saturn in Capricorn and Uranus in Aries around the time that um, the Nazi party started to gain power. So that would be like 1930 to 1931. You have the chart here. Um, this would be, yeah, Saturn overcoming Uranus in a square. There it is. So Saturn in Capricorn and Uranus in Aries. Awesome. Yeah. So, so this is around the time period that, um, the Nazis officially become the biggest political party in Germany. And then it was just a couple of years after this that um, Hitler was elected chancellor in 1933. So um, yeah, that's a, a Saturn Uranus square that uh, is sort of mirroring the one that we're in now because we're also in a closing square of their cycle. Their next conjunction will be um, 20... 2032, I think, will be the conjunction between them. So, um, so yeah, we're we're looking at this sort of like closing square. If we think about like three quarters of any cycle, it's usually some kind of uh, setup for like a new stage to begin whenever the conjunction takes place after that. So that's kind of like the thread or the beginning of some of the transits happening during the Second World War is this closing Saturn Uranus square and then Hitler rising to power. And like, if we're thinking about Saturn Uranus in terms of myth, um, it's, I, I think the parallel between like Hitler rising into power and like Saturn setting itself up for this conjunction with Uranus in another 11 years is really representative of both like the Saturn Uranus story and also um, like Hitler's rise to power and, and the destructive nature of that as well. Mm, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and just also the the disruptiveness. Also, you know, over the past few years, one of the keywords we've seen a lot that's come up with the Saturn Uranus square is things that are um, established structures getting like a stress test, and that if they're not built on a solid foundation, or sometimes even things that you you take for granted and you assume are built on a solid foundation, getting shaken and then all of a sudden if they're not strong just disintegrating or falling apart almost overnight yeah absolutely and that sometimes those stress tests can be very useful if they are against structures that are being built that are ultimately like not in the good of the collective like in in this instance like um, too much Saturn energy can build uh, a, a political party on very solid ground that is not strongly enough opposed by any other political party in Germany, which was part of the issue at that time was just that um, he was like somewhat unopposed at that point in terms of his political power. Mm, okay. Could have used a stress test, I think. Um, right. So moving ahead a little bit, in 1939, which is like when World War II uh, officially began, although obviously like at that point there had been um, so much movement already in terms of like uh, the, the Nazi movement and, and uh, some of the, the camps had already been started at that time. But right. when we get and, to, yeah, and, and really quickly, it's actually maybe worth mentioning to set the context because Nick Diggenbest and I actually just talked about this in the episode that will come out before this one, where we were looking at like the U.S. involvement in World War II, and we had to set that up by talking a little bit about Hitler's rise to power. Um, 
that one of the things that he did that I've only come to realize over the past few years and understand and have a different perspective on by seeing a sort of recurrence of it in modern times is um, I always took some of the things of the anti-Semitism from the 1930s and 1940s as sort of when I learned about them in like elementary school or something as, as that the takeaway that it was like about bigotry or that it was primarily just a, t a form of bigotry, which it was, but there was a, a vehicle that was used for the bigotry, which was partially like like conspiracy theories and stuff. And that's basically what they were using in the 1930s and 40s to gain political power and influence was conspiracy theories about like the, the Jews like running the world or about them being the reason why the Germans lost World War I or other things like that. Um, and that realization over the past few years is we've seen a rise of new forms of conspiracy theories that are influencing like public discourse and politics and things like that it was really eye-opening to me because it was another instance of realizing that some of the same dynamics that led to World War II and led to things like the Holocaust are, are actually still very present in our society today and haven't gone away. They're just in a different form. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that conspiracy is like uh, something that is often seen really commonly in like huge collective trauma or genocide at that level, because it's like, how else do you get millions of people to agree to an agenda like that other than to have them believe something that makes this the only possible way. And so, yeah, conspiracy was definitely like a big part of that. And the context of that time was that um, there was an economic depression happening and uh, the promise of Hitler was, you know, again, we, I think have like seen this pretty recently. I live in Canada, but it's, you know, recent in the States to see someone who comes in and promises like, I'm going to fix the economy and here's how I'm going to do it. And the Holocaust was happening and the war was happening. But underneath all of that was this motivation for money and security and land and resources. And that is often like one of the common motivations behind genocide is actually just like money and land, but skewed in this uh, very hateful way towards certain groups of individuals um, with this sort of conspiracy theory around it. And that's how you get a whole culture or a group of people behind you to like mobilize with that agenda. Right. That makes so much sense. And, and there was inflation, which is weird because we're suddenly dealing with that again today of issues of inflation and economic uncertainty. And then that leads to, or, or is then used as an excuse for, like the scapegoating of, especially of minorities, um, becomes like the the gateway into some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think those are like very Saturn Uranus themes as well. Like Uranus can be like a lot of wacky ideas or like things that are sort of like outside the, the mainstream way of thinking, which is often how conspiracy starts. It's like something outside of like the dominant mode of thinking. Um, and then Saturn is like the cementing of that into practice. But Uranus, I, like often when I see Uranus in uh, charts that involve some kind of like scapegoating or alienation or something like that. It can be like an othering force as well. Mm, okay. That's really interesting. Yeah. And othering and also just the instability or the, the upstart and the rebellious, the there's, there's some dynamic with Saturn Uranus about the person who frames themselves as the rebellion, rebelling against the establishment. And, and there is probably the connection with the myth. Sometimes the person that's able to frame themselves as the rebel or the underdog is able to overthrow something by framing themselves in that way, even if the rebellious role is not always the good one. I mean, in, in Hitler's case, in the early 1930s, he was able to like wedge himself into getting political power, even though the Nazi party wasn't very big at the time. And that ended up being the downfall of like the German government at the time was like giving him more power than they needed to at the time in order to try to placate him because he was like the rebellious 
upstart in some ways. Right, exactly. Yeah. And that theme of rebellion is very Saturn Uranus and also that sense of banishment, like both uh, Uranus and Saturn like banished their children in various ways in order to like not lose grasp on the the level of power that they had established for themselves. And so there is that kind of theme of like, yeah, the rebel coming back to reclaim power in some way, which is very much what I think probably like Germany thought Hitler was doing in the first place. Totally. Because he, he had tried to do, um, you know, in the early 1920s, there was a previous like coup attempt where he attempted um, with the beer hall putsch to like overthrow the government and lead like a political revolution, but he failed just like miserably and they threw him in jail. So him coming back 10 years later and actually pulling off getting into power in the early 1930s was also a little bit of, in terms of his life narrative or story or the way it was framed was, um, was a bit of that at the same time. Oh my God. That's like literally the Saturn story. Like getting punished or like banished to go to Tartarus, which is probably like being in jail in some way. And then like coming back with this, like, I'm going to fix it kind of energy. Um, and then just doing things in his own way. Right. This is so interesting because it makes some of the things that happen back then because they're so long ago. And it's like, when we watch it, it's like videos that are in black and white and it seems so foreign and like how could stuff like that happen? Like you understand then, some of the narratives that were in the air at the time, because you understand the energy at the time of knowing that there was like a Saturn Uranus square, knowing what that energy was like, and then knowing what that looks like when certain individuals like seize on that energy and then try to um, make themselves like the the representatives of it in some way. It becomes a little bit more relatable, at least in understanding what was happening at that time. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think the context of it is everything and trying to imagine what was happening for the average everyday person just living their lives and having families and um, trying to survive and then having someone rising into power who's who's promising a lot and maybe not knowing the full context of what that means or uh, maybe knowing that and sort of prioritizing one's own survival over the implications of that. I think the context of it says everything about like how that actually took place. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right, so then, so then we we jump forward a little bit. Like once Hitler comes to power, um, he starts some of the different um, persecutions and some of the different scapegoating, and then we we eventually get to like the early part of World War II. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, World War II officially started in 1939, which um, was right around the time of a Saturn. Pluto conjunction at that time. So we're getting the start of another Saturn cycle. Um, and you, I mean, I think you meant a square, right? Saturn Pluto. Am I getting this right? 1939. Yeah, so Pluto oh, would yes. have been in, yes. in Cancer. And so Saturn was in like late Aries and going into Taurus, and Pluto was. So then it continued over for another sign. So there was like an extended Saturn Pluto square, especially by sign for a long period of time, which is kind of notable. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So, yeah, sorry, not a conjunction. It's also another overcoming square um, where Saturn is like closing out the last square of the Saturn Pluto cycle. So that's mm -hmm. sort of like the, the early, like, astrology themes of World War II are these like closing Saturn squares with these larger cycles, which is right. also like in we're talking about context. It's interesting because it tells us that World War II came out of the context of what had been happening through those whole cycles, like going back to the last Saturn Uranus conjunction, the last Saturn Pluto conjunction. It's like what's happening there in the closing squares is part of that larger context too. Yeah, and that even I'm like going back and animating the chart, and I can see that, for example, back in the period, the previous period we were just talking about in the early 1930s, Saturn was in Capricorn and it was opposing Pluto in 
uh, cancers. So it's like that was the halfway point in the cycle. And then once you get to the early part of World War II, then you're at the square, which is the next turning point with respect to all that. Exactly. Yeah. And at that opposition, you would have seen the development of something that then is like coming to a culmination during 1939 in the closing square. And closing squares are often like a kind of culmination or like I think of them as like a sort of last call for some of the themes of the the larger cycle. Right. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. So, yeah, then we come along to 1942, which is when Saturn closes its cycle with Uranus and they they form a conjunction. Um, And uh, I believe that was 29 degrees of Taurus. So this would be 1942 is sort of like the height of World War II. Yeah, there they are in late Taurus. Right. So Saturn in, in late Taurus conjunct Uranus in late Taurus. And yeah, by this point, I think the US got involved in World War II in like 1941. So it's like by 1942, like the entire world is embroiled in this conflict. Mm-hmm. It's sort of at its height. And um, I believe the death camps had also been opened at this point because they realized that like originally people had just been sent to these labor camps. And the idea was like, okay, we're just going to like use people in service to labor to jumpstart the economy. Um, but at that point, they realized there were too many people to deal with. And, and so they had started opening these death camps around that time as well. So it, it, the Holocaust and the war around it is sort of at its height at this time as Saturn forms this like meeting with Uranus and, and kind of like brings to completion or fruition, like something that had started during the closing square, but also something that I found really interesting is 1942 is when epigenetics first kind of like made its foray into a larger, uh, accepted practice in science. And so some of the threads of epigenetics started long before that or like some of the research pieces around it. But the term epigenetics and its like acceptance into science also happened in 1942. So that's really interesting to me. Okay. Um, And with the camps and stuff, it wasn't just um, Jewish people that they were killing, but also there are other different groups of people that were being targeted at the same time, right? Absolutely. I I think for obvious reasons, like when people think of the Holocaust, um, they largely think of the Jewish population being affected. Um, But it was uh, also really targeting disabled people and queer people um, and also people of color who were living in Europe. Um, I, I think the the targeted populations got broader and broader as the Holocaust progressed, but actually targeting disabled people was uh, one of the very early stages of the Holocaust as well. And this um, sort of wildly psychotic idea that the Nazi party had of like purifying the white race essentially. And so they were targeting anyone that they believed to be some kind of obstacle or challenge in like the, the purity of the white race. Okay. Um, yeah. And these are all like really heavy outer planet things that are like going on during, during some of these really key periods. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, huge outer planet conjunctions. And then also like with that Saturn Uranus conjunction in 1942, like the seed of something that now has become deeply connected to Holocaust research, like a, a lot of the focus on epigenetics, especially in the last 30 years, has been specifically on children of Holocaust survivors and trying to understand um, like some of the genetic imprints that they have from their parents and how that's gotten passed on. So um, that's why I'm looking at it as like intergenerational trauma is very real, but also 
intergenerational healing is equally real. And so there's something that started literally in the midst of the Second World War and the Holocaust that now as we're coming into like in, in the late 80s when Saturn and Uranus were last conjunct, that would have been when epigenetics was really starting to like progress with some of its research around children of Holocaust survivors and the impacts of it. So we can really clearly see the the correlation between that cycle starting back there in the 40s and and some of the fruitfulness of that that's coming out of it now. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and this whole the Saturn Uranus conjunction during that time is is interesting because it actually gets extended for this period of time from at least 1940 when Saturn's in the early part of of Taurus. It's already in a sign based conjunction with Uranus, which is in the third decan of Taurus at that point. Um, but if you just you know sort of move the chart forward. Um, they eventually do meet up later in Taurus, but um, that conjunction actually continues into Gemini because there's that ingress of Uranus into Gemini uh, in the early 1940s. Um, so it kind of extends that conjunction longer than it would be otherwise if you take into account the entire sign-based conjunctions, because then it goes across Saturn's transit through two different signs. And since Saturn takes like three years to go through a single sign that extends it for, for like six years, which basically um, takes you through pretty much the entire first half of the 1940s. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, which I think is going to be very fascinating to see during our next Saturn-Uranus conjunction in 2032, because it will also be in Gemini. And so we're essentially like right now in the Uranus return of the Holocaust and of the Second World War. Like we have Uranus very close to that like third decan of Taurus for mm -hmm. the first time since then, because we're like about 80 some odd years um, later in time. And so, yeah, it, it's interesting that they, they've carried their conjunction over into Gemini during that time period too, because we'll have our next conjunction in Gemini with, with these planets in, yeah, 2032. Okay. And, and during this period, just to emphasize that in terms of the scope, there was just like, um, millions of people that were affected um, by the Holocaust in the early 1940s, uh, in the first half of the 1940s, and, and in terms of just thinking about the impact on that of that on the lives and the psyches of just huge amounts of people, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And um you know, not all of those people are still living, but uh, many of them are. And so like in, in some way, like the psychological impact of that is still alive in the world. But also, you know, if we're thinking about this intergenerationally, like it's alive in, in the, the children that those people have. I mean, the baby boomers were essentially um, the children of World War II. And so a lot of the, the thinking of the boomer generation is thinking that comes directly out of like a, a post-war environment and people who were being born to parents who had survived the war in some capacity, regardless of like, um, you know, what, what their connection to that might have been. Yeah. So that's so crucial, just thinking about having entire generations of people either experiencing this intense sort of a I don't want to say unprecedented, but it was unprecedented. But then on the other hand, there was other types of um, things like this in the past to a certain extent, just never on that scale. Um, but that type of huge trauma, either experiencing it or being born into that context um, becomes really important in terms of just thinking about that there's other periods of time where there may have been major periods of generational trauma and just how that's passed forward becomes actually a really crucial thing for understanding sometimes the astrological context of certain charts or certain generational placements. Absolutely. And then like knowing the astrological context of that trauma can I think be really helpful in knowing like either when it might get 
uh, triggered in, in like future time periods. And also when there are these windows of opportunity to revisit or integrate some of the expressions of that trauma. Like if someone is born during that, um, Saturn Pluto conjunction or that Saturn Uranus conjunction, looking at like future iterations of that cycle can also indicate opportunities for integration or some kind of movement with the trauma that they're carrying from that time. Mm, okay. I'm trying to think of, so with Saturn, Uranus, and that uh, conjunction going on during the enti this entire period of the early 1940s, I'm trying to think of what the archetype or part of the archetype would be underlying that type of trauma. And I have to think that part of it, just from the experience of the recent Saturn Uranus square, that part of it would be the experience of instability or the fear of instability, like the fear that everything you know or take for granted in life can just be sort of taken away or ripped away unexpectedly and irreversibly at any time, and maybe having a fear surrounding that as part of the generational signature than that, that some people would have experienced in different ways more or less intensely. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Themes around instability and also, I think, really big themes around either belonging or alienation and like the, the two sides of that coin. And I think that that contributes to a lot of the kind of like... Um, like conspiracy theory piece that we were talking about, or just kind of like agreeing to, uh, to different things along the way with something like the Holocaust and, and, and each stage having to agree with something that's happening. Um, and underneath that is like a very human desire for belonging and, and to have safety and, and connection and to like remain in some kind of sense of community. Um, and so I definitely think that like themes around belonging or alienation and like sense of connection have been uh, like extremely relevant in the last couple of years as well. Yeah, that's such a good keyword, alienation and just being like outcast um, as like major themes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, definitely. Okay. So um, are there anything, is there anything else about the the mythology that's kind of relevant during this in terms of this alignment or some of these alignments um, or, or, or should we move on to other like later ones? Yeah. I mean, I could probably talk about this for like another like four days. Um, but, but uh, yeah, it, it's almost feels like endless. Maybe the only other thing is uh, just thinking about like the introduction of Pluto with that and Pluto being like the ruler of the underworld and, um, also Pluto being the, the next intergenerational piece of this like Saturn Uranus story that we're talking about. Um, and so it, it's like when we come to that, uh, Saturn Uranus, uh, sorry, Saturn Pluto square that we have in the late thirties as well. There's like the introduction of this underworld piece into what's happening and also like the level of suffering and unconsciousness and destruction that kind of came after that. Yeah, and, and just Pluto takes things to extremes astrologically, uh, whatever it seems like it touches sometimes, and just the, and the unimaginable scope of it just taken to the utmost extreme in terms of some of the extent of just like death and suffering and other things that were being experienced by people at that time. Yeah, exactly. And I think that idea of extreme is really uh, relevant as, as we kind of move ahead a bit because the, the Saturn-Pluto conjunction after that closing square would have been in 1948. And that's when um, Israel was officially established as a country at that time. Um, and so it certainly has this theme of extremes at the heart of it. Um, I'll just wait till we have the... Here it is. So so it's a, it was a Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Leo in 1948? Yeah, exactly. Um, speaking of the boomer generation, <laughs> it's like a big part of the generation is this signature. Um, but so this would have been 
around the time that Israel was established. And it is, as we can see, a country of extremes that was at the time intended to be like a, a place of refuge for post-war Jews who had nowhere else to go. However, like looking at the conjunction that's seeded into the beginning of this place and the level of like war and destruction that's still happening there, I think there's a lot of um, like interesting reflection on that as well. And Israel itself has kind of, uh, in, in the same way that Saturn returns to like end the cruelty of his father, but then ends up sort of like taking on his own cruelty. I think that there's like a huge component of that in Israel's story as well. And the, the continued like level of war that's happening there from, uh, a place that was meant to be like a closure of war or like a resolution of it in some way. Yeah. And it, and it really brings up the idea of generational trauma being passed on sometimes and still motivating present concerns, even decades or almost a century later, because I know then part of sometimes the, the, the saying or the political motivations become you know, never again, that that something like the Holocaust could never happen again, and therefore we have to do whatever is thought to be necessary, whatever they think is necessary in order to avoid that from happening again, um, so that there can be like, like things like that that are still motivating things a century later from just the intenseness and the extremeness of the trauma that's experienced much earlier. Um, whether that's you know right or wrong in different instances, sort of aside, but just the fact that that is still a motivating factor in decisions that are being made almost a century later really speaks to everything you're talking about in terms of um, epigenetics and generational influences um, being really actually much more important sometimes than we even realize because they're things that are so ingrained and like deep within sometimes our motivations of groups or countries or other things like that, that we almost don't even recognize them because they're taken for granted. Absolutely. And like speaking of Pluto, it can become this like almost obsession that we don't even necessarily know where it's coming from um, or it's coming from this like sort of deeper place that we don't even know how to recognize, which is largely like where trauma gets stored is in the unconscious. And so I think that that seems clear intergenerationally in like what is happening right now in Israel and Palestine and the connection to the late forties and this idea of like never again, but at what cost? And like in the sense that it, it, it may have become this obsessive response to like an incredibly unmanageable level of trauma to, to avoid that trauma ever happening again at all costs. And like, you know, here we are now just after a, a more recent Saturn Pluto conjunction in 2020. And we're seeing that, um, really, really quite stirred up again in that place in the world. Yeah. Well, and it makes me think of some of the things, uh, you know, what the, seeing the pandemic that happened that started really centered on that Saturn-Pluto conjunction in early 2020 and um, the level, the impact that that had on so many people, on millions of people, and how it um, in some ways not, obviously not as much or in, intensely as the Holocaust like in the 1940s, but how different people experienced different types of trauma from the pandemic in 2020 in, in a variety of different ways and how that impacted people and may continue to have residual impacts going forward for many decades or maybe even a century into the future um, just from the intensity of that experience and how it affected some people's psyches in different ways. Absolutely. Like the pandemic itself has been its own cause of trauma for so many people. And then if you think about people who are already facing um, really difficult levels of trauma in their life and, and the way that that can like 
trigger different responses for them. Like it, it makes me think about this idea of epigenetics where like our experiences cause these different reactions to something that's already there in our DNA. And so if we're already people that have these uh, kind of intergenerational responses or themes that we're dealing with, and then this like really massive scale, like several years lasting other trauma comes along, like obviously it's going to stir up a lot of that stuff in a very deep way. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Um, and, and yeah, and people having their astrological DNA with their birth charts or with other intergenerational things that recur in different family placements or, or other things like that. And sometimes those astrological placements can span back way further than anybody would ever expect, which is kind of a fascinating thing uh, to realize as well, is just there's certain astrological signatures that may repeat, that may go back for, for centuries or, or what have you in terms of uh, family or other larger groups dynamics. Absolutely. And that's one of the ways that I think astrology can be really beautiful in like supporting us in this aspect of our lives is like, uh, you know, when things get stirred up, we don't always have a context for like why, or e even just like a, a means to understand what we're feeling. So just looking at uh, other time periods that might be relevant to our family's experience can help give us information about what we're feeling, which is kind of like how I started doing all of this in the first place. <laughs> it's like, why do I feel so stirred up? Ah, Holocaust themes. And then sort of going back and back through my family's story and understanding the correlation between what was happening then astrologically and what was being stirred up for me now. Okay. That's, that makes so much sense. And so, and, and one of the things is we may never actually be able to see or identify the root core starting point of like generational trauma or other things, or to trace it back to the, the original, you know, astrological signature. But what we can do sometimes is by paying attention to history or paying attention to family histories, if you see a certain alignment or a certain aspect or placement coming up over and over again, you can sometimes infer from that if it comes up enough and seems to be tied to some core narrative or theme that keeps repeating over and over again, that somewhere way back in history, there was some sort of like core um, reason why that was tied into that planetary alignment or planetary cycle that goes back to an origin that you may not be able to see, but you can kind of infer its existence at a certain point. Totally. It's like astrology detective work. <laughs> like if everyone in a family has some kind of like really intense Uranus Neptune aspect happening, um, then you can likely infer that that goes back much further than the charts that you have in front of you, or that some kind of like major historical event that took place during a harsh Uranus Neptune aspect may have impacted some earlier generation of that family. Let's take things up to the, the present time. So one of the things that you're really focused on is how in the 1940s, when some of this major generational trauma was happening, there also separately sort of coincidentally was the development of, of this new line of research, of scientific research about how generational traumas and things like that can be passed on through epigenetics. Mm -hmm. So yeah, trying to understand um, the more healing focused aspect of intergenerational work, I was curious to see like uh, what lined up with like the more recent dates of the Saturn Uranus cycle as a kind of signal of like where people might be at with these like post-war imprints that they have been carrying with them since the, the 40s and the dates we were looking at there. So, um, I mean, one kind of obvious piece that I might have touched on is uh, during the last Saturn-Uranus conjunction in the late 80s was around the time that epigenetics started to turn the focus of its research over to the children of Holocaust survivors. Um, and then there became this really uh, strong correlation between like Holocaust research and epigenetics. So that would be, yeah, that late 
Sagittarius conjunction. Um, and uh, that was the last time Saturn and Uranus were conjunct. And uh, so, so... So that's yeah. really fascinating then that we have a like a really a, a planetary cycle repeating itself um, from the 1940s when the Holocaust happened and when epigenetics was sort of being formulated. And then we have a repetition of the Saturn Uranus cycle. And then we have researchers going back and, and actually applying that and talking to Holocaust survivors. Exactly. Like it's so interwoven. Like we're in the early 40s when the Holocaust was at its height and also when epigenetics first officially began. And so those two things are in a way like inextricable. And then we come to the next Saturn Uranus conjunction in the late 80s. And here we are again with epigenetics having this sort of like uh, forward lurch or like this um, change in direction or focus and its connection to the Holocaust, but now in a way that um, ideally is more focused on integration and, and processing some of the trauma rather than um, establishing the trauma in the first place. Okay. So there's like a looking back, which is a classic um, thing about conjunctions, especially outer planet or long-term conjunctions is it's the beginning of a new cycle, but it's also the end of a previous cycle. And there can sometimes be a looking back and um, accounting for what happened in the past or reflecting on what happened in the past in some way. Totally. Yeah. Like, obviously, we often think about the beginning of a cycle as like the beginning of something, but it's exactly that. It's also like the closure of whatever the cycle is that we've just come through. And for Saturn Uranus, that's like a 45 year cycle. So it's also this like closure of the last 45 years and everything that's happened in that time. Um, and so it's it's like closing this piece with the Holocaust, but also opening this next piece of the Saturn Uranus cycle that we are still in the midst of. So that late 80s conjunction was also like the opening of a lot of the themes that um, are current now um, in, in our experience and with Saturn and Uranus. Okay. So, and what did the research, the epigenetic research, um, it was focusing its attention on the children of Holocaust survivors. So it's focusing on how that's passed down or how there are certain things passed down through generations and, and that component and, and how it affects things. Yeah, exactly. It was the, the first time that I think they started to really see how specific and correlated the uh, like uh, physiological experiences are of children of Holocaust survivors to like the experience of war that their parents went through. So, I mean, there were some sort of obvious broader pieces that they noticed, such as like anxiety, depression, like a sense of hypervigilance, um, a, a sense of um, uh, what, uh, what's the word, like imagining or presupposing catastrophe or things falling apart, like some of the the beliefs that you would um, imagine come from people who have experienced extreme war conditions. And then like when they started to really get into the more like genetic component, it was, it's quite striking, like even just like there's an example that always stuck with me of how like people who have experienced extreme starvation during war will undergo these like epigenetic adaptations so that um, their body stops sig signaling hunger to their brain because uh, it's their meals are going to be very few and far between. Um, and so their brain stops responding to like natural signals of hunger and all these things. And it, it changes their um, experiences of digestion and all these things. And then they started noticing that children who are born to Holocaust survivors or other people who have experienced war conditions um, have these very maladapted digestive systems a lot of the time. And they were noticing that that's actually like a imprint that's carried over from their parents. So the parents actually passed on the imprint of um, eating uh, like small or insufficient amounts of food so that now if you have a generation that's actually like 
able to access more food and like have a more holistic experience in their diet, um, their bodies are not actually like equipped to be able to like eat that much. And so it causes digestive issues, like things like that, that were um, starting to become clear in the research around that time of like the effects that were being passed on quite directly. Wow. That's really wild. So those are real sort of tangible ways that it's impacting things from earlier generations or like impacting the current lives of, of people that are present that didn't experience those things in the present, but are still having sort of the residual impact of that in some way generations later. Exactly. And like, you know, I grew up in a Jewish family, so there's always all kinds of jokes about how like um, people in Jewish families often have like bad digestion and all these kinds of things. And it was sort of like a, a joke when I was younger. And then growing up and like learning more about this, I was like, whoa, and actually starting to like consider why that might be um, something that's so commonly associated with Jewish families. And, and the actual like reason behind it was like quite mind blowing. Wow. Okay. Um, one of the keywords you used just a minute ago is catastrophe, and I think that's a really good Saturn Uranus keyword. Actually, the more I think about it, mm. oh yeah, absolutely. And I think Saturn and Uranus both have their own like versions of catastrophe, <laughs> and mm. then like it's almost like opposing versions of catastrophe in a way, which like when put together can be potentially extra destructive or liberating depending on which way you go with it. But it does, I think like some of the historical events during the Saturn Uranus cycles have been a bit catastrophic as we've seen. Yeah. I just looked up a definition on Google and it says catastrophe, an event causing great and often sudden damage or suffering, a disaster. Um, and then disaster, of course, is you know an old word that's tied into astrology because it means like bad star or unfortunate star or what have you. Oh yeah! Wow, that's wild. Which is and actually yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, it's just funny because then it, my brain connects it ironically with the inverse, which is like good star. That's actually what the phrase like Mazel Tov means. It's like good star, good zodiac sign, or or what have you. Yeah, I love that. I love that. It's like a like a wishing away of the the bad star disaster. Um, but yeah, that that idea of like sudden disaster, like sudden striking, is very um, Uranian. I think there's always like some kind of like shock involved with like a Uranus transit. Right, for sure. And a, and a sort of falling away of, of a foundation of something that's like built up like a, like a building or something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. So that kind of brings us up to the present. And, and when they started with epigenetics, identifying and interviewing some of those um, survivor, children of Holocaust survivors and identifying some of those things, like you mentioned, the almost the the issue with eating or, or potential. I don't know if can you if you can categorize that as like an eating disorder or or what have you. But what then happens after that? Is there then a way to address that or to heal that or or um, what was the next step? Mm, yeah. Well. I guess I'm also curious to like see how that continues to unfold because like epigenetics is relatively young as like a, a scientific field, I guess. Um, mm. But there seems to be some agreement in it that um, our like it comes back to this idea of our experience and our environment being able to impact what's happening uh, in in those like responses to DNA. So I don't know if that's necessarily to say that like someone who's born with um, really difficult digestive experiences as a result of having like parents in a war can then reverse their digestive experience. But I do think that there is some malleability to um, like these genetic responses that we have through the environment that we cultivate for ourselves over the course of our lives. And so there's always that X factor where like many things are beyond our control. And I I'm certainly not a person who believes that we can just kind of like 
positive think our way, like out of our different <laughs> like struggles and traumas. Um, if anything, like it requires like a deep acceptance of the things that are beyond our control and that we can't just like wish away. At the same time, I think that this field introduces like a lot of agency into our experience because as much as we're po as much as it is possible for us to create nurturing connected healing environments for ourselves that's where we can start to reverse some of the detrimental effects of the trauma that we're carrying through um through these like intergenerational pieces okay yeah and maybe just the recognition recognition that we're not just like a blank slate like a tabula rasa um which is something astrology you know ironically in and of itself already teaches us with the birth chart that, that we come in with certain traits potentially or certain predispositions let's say even at, at most broadly in some ways some of this with epigenetics is sort of saying something similar that there may be certain things that we're coming in with but that the identification and recognition of some of those things may itself be helpful because then you can move forward with a greater um, understanding of some of your own dynamics and then can make choices a little bit more consciously in terms of how you deal with or how you harness some of those things. Yeah, totally. Like we are not blank slates by any means. I like to think about our charts and our experience that we come into the world with as like our kind of fabric that we have to work with. And so it's like, you, you know, you are handed this particular fabric and you can't just like toss it out the window and go and get a new one unless you're, I don't know, starting a new life or something like that, which is a whole other conversation. But, um, I do think that like what we do with that fabric, we do have some, some agency over and, and some relationship to. So for me, it has, a lot to do with also recognizing that there are patterns that are happening and, and being able to identify what those patterns are. And both intergenerational work and astrology for me are like some of the biggest like pattern recognition systems that I've found in my experience. It's like both of those systems and then also together help us to understand that there are patterns or cycles that are occurring that we are um, deeply connected to. And then also like how might we work with those patterns in, in our own way and, and through the environments that we create in our life. Okay. Um, and I know we don't have to go into all the charts, but I know you had at least broadly, I don't know if you want to speak to it, some like examples of like Venus, Saturn, and Uranus themes um, relating to like suffering and struggle with love and healing that emerged in some like client studies that you had done. Yeah. So I had um, a set of example charts from um, some clients that I work with who also come from a family of Holocaust survivors. And I've worked with both like the um, like children of the survivors and grandchildren in that family. So I have a pretty good sense of like the different generational pieces in that particular family. And yeah, it would be probably be a lot to look at the individual charts themselves, but that family, um, they have uh, a lot of Saturn Uranus themes in all of their charts. And, uh, so the, the, individuals like the grandparents who experienced the war themselves were born during the Saturn Uranus opposition that would have been like, um, I guess sometime around like the late twenties would have been, I might be wrong if I go back and look at the dates, but it was the opposition that was before the closing square that we looked at in 1939. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Late twenties. And, um, Saturn Uranus themes, and then um, a lot of Saturn Venus themes as well, and Saturn in harsh aspects with Venus or Saturn maltreating Venus. Um, and in that family, there have been a lot of themes around um, severing and this this sort of like disconnect or or scapegoating or banishment that we talked about around Saturn Uranus themes and also this um uh, like struggle for love and healing that i think speaks to the harsh aspects with venus as well and so 
this is one of the ways that I think can be really useful and beneficial to like use astrology as a kind of intergenerational healing template is to be able to look at these family systems and identify some of the repeated themes that are there and then go back and say like, where does this actually come from? Like what is the circumstance from which these difficult Saturn Venus themes emerged. And like, it's, you know, this is hypothetical, but possibly if we went back to further generations in that family pre-war, perhaps some of those themes would not even be there. Like it might actually be something that comes directly out of that experience. Right. But, and so the access point for that would be actually talking about the family history of the client and that perhaps if you started like asking questions like that or had in the back of your mind as a consulting astrologer, that there can be like generational traumas that you might ask about the family history um, if you don't know the person's background and that sometimes through that uh, in that line of inquiry, as, as an astrologer, but also potentially with like telling, I can imagine if you if you talked about like the myth of Saturn Uranus, some of those themes of like banishment that come up with that myth in that myth would probably resonate with the client at that point. And that's where the mythological component sort of comes into play at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. And if that client is like open to sharing their story, it can often like provide a really helpful grounding context. But again, like even if we don't have that story, we can look at the chart and see the Saturn Venus themes and and tell the story of like where Venus comes from and, and some of the like themes happening in the myth. And it, I think immediately like bears connection to that person's experience, even if we don't know like the details of like what has played out for them in their direct lived experience. Okay. Um, and what were some of the ways in which like the myth became relevant in those instances or in which you've seen specifically like the Saturn Venus myth become relevant? Uh, well, like in the myth itself, Saturn kind of creates Venus, but like indirectly and through this like very destructive act. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. Like, can we say that Saturn created Venus? I don't know. Or that even Uranus did. And so like, it, it's interesting that Venus has this, you know, very benefic representation as being um, a planet of love and, and connection and all things beautiful. But actually, if we're looking at the myth, that comes from a tortured place. Like it comes from a place of severing, essentially. And, and reluctance that it happened, Venus was created not willfully or deliberately, but through an act that was kind of like thrust upon Uranus. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of the um, other mythological associations with Venus have that theme of reluctance to them, like right down to like Persephone being abducted into the underworld against her will and, and that kind of thing. And so I think that seeing Saturn or Uranus like in relation to Venus can often um, bring to mind themes like that, where it's like there, there's some kind of like severing or harshness or reluctance or imposition against our experience of beauty and connection. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So um, in terms of like healing and sort of the focus to bring things around uh, with our topic in terms of intergenerational healing through astrology, at this point, um, sometimes just it's the the talking about and the identification of some of our core myths or family or intergenerational myths and being able to recognize and see some of those dynamics that we otherwise might have taken for granted or not realized how they're impacting us is that that's obviously like the first step, but maybe the most important step and the most useful way that, that astrology can be helpful in terms of using this as a tool for healing or helping individuals or clients or even for astrologers to, to identify some of those things in their own background in a way that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think 
just like you said, it, like the awareness around the cycles and patterns that we are a part of uh, might be the first piece, but also in some ways the biggest piece. And so I think just being able to like identify the patterns that are there can be profoundly healing in and of itself, but also holding this sense that like, while there are many factors largely out of our control and, and some parts of our experience are just things that we we live with and, and our continued themes in our experience, we also have this malleability around the things that we have inherited, that they are not always entirely stuck. And I think that that um, correlates with the, the way that I love to practice astrology, which is like, we're going to have our same chart for the rest of our lives. Like our chart is our chart, but there is a malleability within that where we have some flexibility or some capacity to find these uh, other like neural pathways of the chart that can be expressed differently as we build different environments and, and types of connection for ourselves in our lives. So I, I think like looking at the myth and starting to like consider our charts and the charts that we're looking at through the, the lens of these like intergenerational myths can be really healing. And also looking at the, the family systems as we've been talking about and, and different family charts. Um, but also there's something to like, I think understanding what's ours and what's not ours and that there are a lot of aspects of our lives that we might feel, but that are not ours. Like it's not coming from our experience. And I, I think astrology can help us understand that as well with some of like the pieces of the chart that um, might relate to, you know, the experiences of others or like the things that are inherited and, and understanding like what in our chart is part of our experience, but not like ours personally, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I like the realistic approach of, of saying that we're embracing and recognizing some of these things, not necessarily in order to transcend them completely, because that may not be possible, but that once sometimes some of these dynamics are recognized, um, that you can maybe choose to play out different versions of that archetype in a way that's slightly different than you might otherwise if you were just proceeding forward, um, not understanding your own background and not understanding your own history and not being able to learn the lessons from that or to be able to make a choice um, if that choice was never offered to you. Um, so it might not just like completely change and revolutionize everything, but it may help you make make choices about your life and where you go forward um, in a way that is um, just a little bit more conscious than you might otherwise. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It, it kind of makes me think about what we were talking about earlier around uh, like the planets moving as more of like a, a directional spiral than anything that's just like in a straight circle or a straight line or something like that, that it's like... Um, <sighs> I don't really think that it's about making some kind of ultimate progress where we like transcend all difficulty um, to the best of my knowledge, like no living person has ever like really done that. Maybe like the closest we get to that is actually like a deep acceptance of a lot of the cycles that we are actually a part of. And so I think yeah, there's a lot of healing that comes from recognizing the patterns themselves and then also like recognizing the larger like generational component to them and then using the tools that we do have to address that in the ways that we're able to. And, and I find astrology to be like a really beautiful way to do that. I love that. That's brilliant. That's really beautiful to the... the directive then is is for each of us to become a spiral rather than a circle and to repeat some of our patterns um, which in some ways is inevitable to a certain extent that some of the inertia that's built up not just in our own lives but from the generations that came before us that inertia is inevitable and can't be, just be re redirected or stopped or brought to a halt completely 
Um, we're still going to keep going through some of those cycles and some of those patterns are going to repeat, but um, with a little bit of effort and a little bit, bit of a push, maybe you can push the overall trend in a specific direction, in a more desirable direction, so that it becomes a, a spiral in forward movement rather than just a closed loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and using those themes that we have to work with in different ways so that it's not like, like you said, the exact same circle that's happening over and over, which is often what it can feel like to be stuck in a trauma loop. It's like reliving the same experience over and over and over, even though it seems like the details of the experience are changing. And so I think this gives us a little more spaciousness where there can be some kind of like opening within that cycle or, or some kind of like uh, movement within it rather than it being an entirely closed loop for us. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Um, all right. I think that kind of brings us to a good stopping point in terms of this discussion because I feel like we've actually come full circle, but we've also moved forward uh, several steps at the same time. Um, so I feel like we've, we've done our own spiral here pretty well. Totally. We were just, you know, like setting the example for what we're trying to explain. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I definitely think we will probably start repeating ourselves being on our own loops at, at a certain point uh, if we're not careful. Um, all right. Is there any other points that you meant to touch on or, or things before we start to wrap up? I do want to ask you, you know, about your work and like other things. Um, but anything before we, we end this part of the discussion? Yeah, I guess just to say that this is something that I have been like working on and researching and integrating for the last few years. Um, but it's, it's new and for me will probably be a lifelong process. So I'm very like interested to chat with other astrologers who are like curious about this or working with this in their own way. Um, my friend Ari Felix also has their own beautiful perspective on planets as ancestors and um, a lot of really beautiful work that they're doing sort of in this theme as well. But I'm uh, very interested to like uh, explore deeper conversation with other astrologers who are curious to learn more about this. Um, so that's one thing that comes to mind. And uh, yeah, the other is, yeah, I'm just... Um, open to like continuing this conversation and and seeing how this develops especially as the next saturn uranus conjunction comes around in about 10 years <laughs> yeah we've got some like heavy astrology to get through in between now and then which is one of the things um i talked about in the previous episode we were talking about uranus coming up to gemini again and you know that does repeat the sort of time frame of, of part of World War II, which I know has made some astrologers nervous lately, wondering how that's going to go and where things will go. But it will also be interesting seeing the forward movement and momentum also of like closing down some long-term cycles and hopefully um, there being some progress and like moving forward uh, as well at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And, and hopefully that sense of a spiral where we may see some echo or we may already be seeing some echo of themes from that time, but that um, also it's not in exactly the same place or there is this kind of sense of difference that happens is my hope. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, so where can people find out more information about you? What else do you offer? You do consultations and also teach, right? Yeah, I do consultations and pretty regular workshops. Um, and in addition to my astrology practice, um, I work with another modality that is actually looking at people's repetitive life patterns. So <laughs> that's a big part of my focus. Um, and then I do tarot as well. Um, and I play music and run a music festival. So that's sort of the other half of my life. But if people are curious to learn more about me, uh, my website is erinfogel.com. And um, I'm on social media mostly as Queen of Swords, which is my band. So you can find me there in that way. Yeah, you actually, it's a really popular music festival called Venus Fest that you organize in Toronto, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've been doing that since 20. 
17. And uh, yeah, we work with um, different marginalized identities within music. And it's been a really, really beautiful journey with that. Awesome. All right, cool. Um, well, I'll put a link to your website in the description below this video on YouTube or on the description page on the podcast website for this episode so people can find out more information about your work and reach out. And um, yeah, I look forward to seeing more of your research in the future and where you go and hopefully maybe writing a book or something on this at some point. It's been on my mind, yeah, and I uh, am in the process of developing kind of like a, a program around this for my clients and people that I work with. Um, so if people want to sign up for my mailing list, they can hear about that when it comes out. But this conversation is sort of like a, a bit of like an overview or part of the development of um, something that I uh, intend to be like a deeper part of my offering for sure. Awesome. Cool. Well, I look forward to seeing that. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me today for this discussion. Um, we were putting it together over the course of the past few weeks, and I wasn't sure, you know, at the podcast, sometimes it, uh, there's different versions of the podcast. There's like an overly prepared version of the podcast, and there's an underprepared version. And we were somewhere in the middle, but we found something during the course of this discussion that ended up being a lot more rich and um, and engaging and surprising in going in directions I didn't expect. So I really enjoyed it. So thanks for joining me today. I'm grateful to hear that. I would say my personality tends towards both under and over prepared at the same time. So that makes sense. <laughs> nice. But uh, yeah, I feel really grateful to have been able to talk about this with you because I feel like it has like come alive for me in a whole other way through this conversation. I'm really excited to see like where things go after that. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, uh, thanks for joining me today. Thanks everyone for watching or listening to this episode of the Astrology Podcast, and we'll see you again next time. A special thanks to all the patrons that helped to support the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, shout out to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Issa Sabah, Jake Otero, Mimi Stargazer, and Jean Marie Kaplan. If you appreciate the work I'm doing here on the podcast and you'd like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through our page on patreon.com. In exchange, you can get access to bonus content that's only available to patrons of the podcast, such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the monthly forecast episodes, our monthly auspicious elections podcast, or another exclusive podcast series called the Casual Astrology Podcast, or you can even get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, visit patreon.com slash astrologypodcast. If you're looking to get an astrological consultation, we have a list of recommended astrologers at theastrologypodcast.com slash consultations. The astrologers on the list are friends of the podcast that have been featured in different episodes over the years, and they have different specialties such as natal astrology, electional astrology, synastry, rectification, or horary astrology. You can get a 10% discount when you book a consultation with one of the astrologers on our list by using the promo code ASTROLOGYPODCAST. The astrology software that we use and recommend here on the podcast is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available for the PC at alabe.com. Use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we recommend a software program called Astro Gold for Mac OS, which is from the creators of Solar Fire for PC, and it includes both modern and traditional techniques. You can find out more information at astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount. If you'd like to learn more about my approach to astrology, then I'd recommend checking out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune where I go over the history, philosophy, and techniques of ancient astrology, taking people from beginner up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. You can get a print copy of the book through Amazon or other online retailers, or there's an ebook version available through Google Books. I also recently published a new translation of the anthology of the 2nd century astrologer Vedius Valens, which is one of the most important sources for understanding the practice of ancient astrology. You can find that by searching for Vedius Valens the Anthology on Amazon or other online book retailers. If you're really looking to expand your studies of astrology, then I would recommend my Hellenistic Astrology course, which is an online course on ancient astrology 
where I take people through basic concepts up through intermediate and advanced techniques for reading birth charts. There's over 100 hours of video lectures, as well as guided readings of ancient texts, and by the time you finish the course, you will have a strong foundation in how to read birth charts, as well as make predictions. You can find out more information at courses.theastrologyschool.com. I also recently launched a new course there called the Birth Time Rectification Course, where I teach students how to figure out your birth time using astrology when the birth time is either unknown or uncertain. You can find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com. Each year, the podcast releases a set of astrology calendar posters for the coming year, and we've just released our 2023 Planetary Alignments and Planetary Movements posters, which are now available on our website at theastrologypodcast.com slash store. There you can also pick up our 2023 Electional Astrology Report, where Lisa Scheim and I went through the next 12 months and we picked out the single most auspicious date for each month using the principles of electional astrology. You can get that at theastrologypodcast.com slash 2023 report. And finally, thanks to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer Magazine, which is a quarterly astrology magazine which you can read in print or online at mountainastrologer.com. Finally, thanks also to the Northwest Astrology Conference, which is happening May 25th through the 29th, 2023, just outside of Seattle. This year's conference is going to be a hybrid conference where you can either attend online or in person. Find out more information at norwac.net. 